response is good. Like tell someone they say what is good about the man. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. There is something I like in communication for a portable smile. And I want I want to hear it. So your response, let me hear an audible because for the club here you like here audible smile so i'm going to try that again good morning everyone awesome i'm awesome. not seeing president's audible smile <laughs> now I'm, I'm i'm seeing it all right it's a it's a great delight and honor for us to be here to welcome you to this um is this still plush it plush is. moving it is. pick it is. uh ambassador hotel for the 23rd annual public lecture of the GMA. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where we put our hands together. We're holding this 23rd session under the theme, the epidemic of cancers in Ghana, improving access to prevention and early detection and treatment. To get this session underway, we will be having an opening prayer and we would like to invite Dr. Justice Arthur, the chairperson for the Central Division of the Ladies Economic and gentlemen, Council. let's order his steps. Let's welcome him. Please, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of another day. We thank you for our lives. Thank you for traveling mercies. We thank you for our nation, Ghana. We thank you for our health system. We thank you for Ghana Medical Association and the entire nation. We commit ourselves unto you. This gathering is unto you. We pray that whatever we are coming to learn, we'll be able to know what is good for us so that we'll have a healthy population who will be able to develop the nation. We pray committing our speakers onto your hands. May you give them the ability to deliver whatever they have to, so that each and every one of us will understand that at the end we'll have every cause to give you praise and honor. This is what we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, Osofu. Right. So there are a few, um, everyone here is important. Uh, there are a few persons here that we specifically requested their presence. And so as protocol demands, since they are here, we would like to recognize them. Uh, in due course, those who join would also introduce them. And when we notice some that we have managed to sneak in without detection, uh, we, would, we would send the hotspot to them. So let's... Welcome with a round of applause these individuals. So representing the, the regional minister for Greater Accra is the MC for Adenta. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the Honorable Alexander Daniel Ninoy Adumwa. Honorable, you're welcome. It also gives me great delight and honor to introduce the Deputy DG of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Anthony Adolfo Ofusu. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are also joined here by the Deputy CEO of the, of the NHIA the National Health Insurance Authority. Let's welcome Dr. Mrs. Yapukua Baden. We also have we also have the the area head Africa area head of Rush pharmaceuticals. Let's make welcome um, 
this one you'd have to forgive me if i if i so if i uh, nail it let me help you oh. you don't eat okra soup often so <laughs> i have to help you on this one so he's in the person of mr chumi machirin i hope i got it right <laughs> now you can go back to your uh abenkwai the the other one to need okra which one is that so would also introduce respectfully the country manager for rush products ghana limited this one is not easy <laughs> you know in south africa there's this language where they are clicking sounds so yet so uh you clap clap for that yes so she's motumi gotsaso is that it thank you I think uh, okra soup is good. You should be eating okra soup very often. So we'll keep introducing dignitaries among us as we, 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 let's, as we get them. Let's recognize, um, yeah. as if you look over to my extreme right, your extreme left, the front, there are a bevy of lovely women who have joined us. And I would like to introduce their head. The, um, there's a president of the Greater Accra Market Traders Association, and their lead is Madame Mesina Afroa Nijan. Well, this program has a host. It's put together by the Greater Accra Division of the GMA, and there's a chairperson. So even though you ironed your clothes this morning to come here, knowing the very purpose for which you are here, we are asking our Ebusunya Pinyin to come and tell us why he has summoned this meeting. OK, so. Um, Ebusia Penyi, we've heard, is trying to welcome some of the Ebusia people around. And um, before that then, what we'll do is to introduce the chairperson of the occasion. And then Ebusia Penyi, when finally he finishes giving his family people some food, he can come and join us. So we'd like to introduce the chairperson. Uh, this chairperson likes being introduced in just one or two sentences, else... Uh, he will not chair. So I'll keep it short. So he's in the person of Dr. Frank Siribuo. Dr. Frank Siribuo is the current president of the Ghana Medical Association. He's one of the long, longest serving, no, the longest serving executive of the association. He's also the medical director for Bekwai Municipal Hospital. Let's receive him with a rousing round of applause. I think I went beyond the two sentences, so I might get a query. Thank you very much, Richard, for not talking too much. You realize that I have to do a quick detour to go and greet my teacher, Prof. Lorna. If I don't go and greet her, then I'm in trouble. Yes. OK, so I am told I have to hold my horses. So I will hold. Um, do I have to go and take my seat? Or I should be here? OK, thank you. Uh, once the MC says I can be here, then I'll be here. Ladies and gentlemen, we invited the, the chief, the manche of the traditional area in which we are having this program. And I have been given indication that he is in the foyer. So respectfully, given honor to whom honor is due, may I ask us to rise as we usher in the Osu Manche. Ni, uh, this, um, so I'll take it slowly. Te 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 ni no te uwu the fourth. Ladies and gentlemen, let's with a rousing round of applause, let's welcome the Osu Manche.
to take his seat and join us this morning. Can we please keep the applause going? Let's keep the applause going as Nee makes his way. Louder, 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 louder. Also beautifully clad in his resplendent apparel. Joining us for this 23rd annual GMA public lecture. The Usu Manche. Ni, you're most welcome. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let's take our seats. So we would return to our chairman for his response. Let's welcome the chair again. Thank you very much. And it's always good uh, when you want to talk and you are interrupted. Um, the Honorable Regional Minister, represented by Honorable Alexander Ninoy Aduamwa, MC of Adenta, the Manche of Osualata, Ninoy Te Uwo the Fourth, the Deputy Director General of Ghana Health Service, Dr. Anthony Adolfo Ofosu, the keynote speaker, Professor Benedict N.L. Calistego, the Chief Executive of Rush, Dr. Mutumi, I've avoided the first name conveniently, Mr. Matrin Chomi, um, the Area Head of Africa for Rush, the Deputy Director, CEO, NHIA, Dr. Mrs. Yapukua Baden, the Chairperson of Public Lecture Committee, Dr. Mrs. Greta Larson Rindolph, and the committee members. I see some chief executives also around, my own Dr. Njedu, CEO of Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, the invited guests, distinguished speakers who will be talking to us this morning, council members, fellows of the Ghana Medical Association, the press, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Let me take this opportunity to welcome all of you to the 23rd Annual Public Lecture of the Ghana Medical Association under the team, The Epidemic of Cancers in Ghana, Improving Access to Prevention, Early, de early Detection and Treatment. I will not attempt to touch on any of the details as far as the team and the sub-teams are concerned. We have invited experts here to speak to us, and I have every confidence that they will do a good job and they will deal with each subject comprehensively. And I beg you, please uh, reduce the science uh, words if you can. We break it down, Dr. Connie, I know you. If we are not careful, we won't hear anything. So, as the president of the Ghana Medical Association, I would like to express my profound appreciation to Rush Pharmaceuticals for partnering with GMA in sponsoring part of the public annual, the annual public lecture since 2022. Um, last year, they were with us in Ho, and this year, we are here again in Accra. Let me specially mention Dr. Philip Anderson. I don't know how come Rush money to lose him. I don't know. Was it, was it, he was, was he bought by a better company or they have more money than Rush? That's how Philip got lost. Because we started this with Philip Anderson. And of course, Dr. Jones, Jedu, is also around. I see him. Jones, give us a wave. Yes, great. Yeah, Jones is back there. 
thank you very much. Uh, Louisa Precon and all the other members of the team, we are grateful for the outstanding role you played to ensure that this partnership actually saw the light of the day. Let me also take, the, take this opportunity to remind Rush that we do have a bigger agenda, and that is to do with um, the shared vision of supporting specialist training in medical oncology in collaboration with the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. I know that a little bit of work is ongoing, but we need to speed the process to ensure that we get some doctors to go and quickly train as specialists in medical oncology and come back. I think that will be one of the legacies that uh, I will be leaving with the GMA. So I hope I'm able to achieve this before I end my, my term. Or I'll certainly I'll be here. Don't worry. Campaign. I'll go for a second term. So, on this note, let me thank our media partners, Joy FM, Joy News, Joy Online, Adum TV and Adum Online. We appreciate your support, and I'm sure throughout the last few weeks or days, uh, you granted our doctors the opportunity to be able to start the education even before we got to this level that we have all congregated here. There are a lot of us also online listening. Let me say that we are happy to have you online. And the numbers online is quite huge, even more than those of us who are here. So we are grateful for all of those who are online. It is my hope that all of us would enjoy this program, and at least we will have to take something home at the end of the day. Thank you very much for inviting me to chair this program, and I accept to chair the same. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Frank Serbo president of uh, GMA. Ladies and gentlemen, we also have the pleasure of the company of the affable head of pediatric oncology, Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Let's welcome the presence of Professor Lona Awu Reina. See, the name, the name rhymes. We also have the pleasure of the company of the Dean of Family Health University College, Dr. Flesher Jude Leto. And ladies and gentlemen, we also have the pleasure of your company. Let's invite our host to give us an appropriate welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairperson of the Greater Accra Division of the GMA, let's welcome Dr. Ernest Yeo. Thank you, William, for the introduction and good morning once again. The chairman and the president of GMA Dr. Frank Sibo, council members here in Guarded, fellows of the association, the chief of OSU, I recognize your presence. The deputy director general of Ghana Health Service, the distinguished speakers that we invited, all guests here seated, colleague doctors and healthcare practitioners who are here and also join us online and the general public, whether present or also online. Good morning once again. The Greater Accra Division was excited when we were notified that we would host this year's public lecture. Indeed, we are happy to be part of a process that seeks to create and increase awareness in the, on the second most common cause of death worldwide, that is cancers. As a practitioner in the non-communicable diseases space myself, I'm very much aware of the devastation that cancers wreak on its victims and the challenges and complexities in managing the disease. That is why the division has provided all the necessary support to council, to the national secretariat, and indeed the organizing committee, which I'm part, to ensure that we have a successful program activities that's been lined up. It is my prayer, and on behalf of the Greater Accra Division, that this program and its um, associated activities 
make the necessary impact in creating awareness and also improve the early recognition, treatment, and reduce the impact of cancer on cancers on persons who unfortunately suffer it. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I wish to welcome everyone, whether physically present or online, to the greater Accra um, region and the capital city, Accra. And indeed, they say Accra is Ghana. Well, it's debatable, but I think it's true. The spirit of Accra is the spirit of the country. On behalf of the Greater Accra Division, once again, I wish all of us a successful program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ebusia Pinyin, for the welcome. This event has been put together under the direction of a very hardworking committee. And it gives me pleasure to invite the chairperson of the GMA Public Lecture Committee to give us the purpose of our gathering. With a round of applause, let's welcome Dr. Rita Larson Randolph. much. Distinguished guests, it's my pleasure to also declare the purpose for public, share knowledge, receive feedback, and inspire confidence in the association as well as in the medical profession. And this year, we chose the theme, the epidemic of cancers in Ghana, improving access to prevention, early detection, and treatment. As an association, we are very concerned about the rising incidence of cancer in Ghana. And we have the experts here who will be giving us the exact burden of the of cancers. And we know that sadly, majority of some factors that negatively affect their prognosis. And some of these factors that account for the late presentation and the generally poor outcomes that confront our cancer patients include the low public awareness of cancers, and then on the part of healthcare workers, low index of suspicion, the challenges about diagnostics, lack of adequate infrastructure, inaccessible cancer treatments, and lack of funding support, low reimbursement programs for cancer diagnosis and treatment, among others. So it is in this light that the National Executive Council of the Ghana Medical Association chose to deliberate on the theme the epidemic of cancers in Ghana, improving access to prevention, early detection, and treatment. We as members of the Ghana Medical Association are key actors at the forefront of health service delivery in Ghana. And we are very focused on helping to build a very efficient, effective, and sustainable health system to ensure, to ensure a healthy population and therefore, this morning, we look forward to deliberating on very important issues that are related to the hidden epidemic of cancers. So among the things that will be discussed here will be the burden of cancers in Ghana, the challenges encountered by cancer patients even as they seek care, 
the importance of early detection and diagnosis, the funding opportunities available for cancer diagnosis and treatment, and then what policies can be adopted to improve cancer care, building the capacity of healthcare workers. And our GMA president mentioned his vision of partnering with Roche to do this. We also discussed palliative care and the importance of having a cancer registry as a nation. So this public lecture this morning is bringing together various stakeholders to deliberate on this all important topic. And it is our hope that at the end, members of the public will be better informed and policymakers' attention will be drawn to the need to take concrete steps to improve cancer care in Ghana. Enjoy the deliberations today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Larson Rindo, for this welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, up next is, we're going to receive the address of our host regional minister. And as I've already introduced, he's not here in person today, but he's competently represented by the MCE, the Honorable MCE for Adenta. And I have uh, met and observed our guest a few times, and I can say that he's always a man who comes across as a quintessential gentleman, well manicured hair, immaculate sense of dressing, um, what you would find striking is that he always has uh, a pair of trousers that is sharply ironed. You know, the line in the front of the trousers is always perpendicular to the radius of his shoe. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, help me make welcome the Honorable MCE for Adenta, Mr. Alexander Daniel Ninoy Edumwa. Let's usher him. Honorable, you're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, the trousers. Thank you very much. For a moment, I was looking around to find out who he was describing. I knew it wasn't me. I have a little challenge this morning, but... Um, I'll make do, or I'll find a solution as I go along. Mr. Chairman, the President of the Ghana Medical Association, Ni Usumanje, Professor Benedict Kalistego, our keynote speaker, the Deputy Director General of the Ghana Health Services, and the Deputy Director of the National Health Insurance, I hope I got it right, Insurance Authority. Members of the National Executive Committee of the Ghana Medical Association, Regional Director, Ghana Health Service, Medical Practitioners Present, Na Jayelo Eniobie, Nyehamanye, Nyehamanye. Uh, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I bring you warm greetings from the Greater Accra Regional Minister, the Honorable Henry Quarty, who is the MP for Ayaso Central, who would have loved to be here with us this morning, but is currently engaged in an equally important national assignment. It is therefore a great pleasure and an honor to welcome you all to the 23rd Ghana Medical Association 
annual public lecture. Permit me to use this opportunity to express our heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to the leadership of the Medical Association for the opportunity to engage you and to share some few thoughts. Dr. Chairman, as one of the foremost professional organizations in this country, the Ghana Medical Association remains relevant and distinguished to achieve and sustain optimal health care delivery in the country. Even though your primary, your primary objective is to secure the well-being of your members, your advocacy and contributions towards shaping national discussions cannot be overemphasized. I therefore wish to use this opportunity to commend you for your dedication and sacrifices as frontline health practitioners during the recent pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, the nation will be eternally grateful for your prompt response and services during the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, all around the world, there was relief and excitement when the WHO officially declared that COVID-19 was no longer a public health emergency of international concern. In Ghana, under the leadership of His Excellency, the President, Nana Adodankwa Akufuado, the government was commended with the management of the pandemic and the numerous policies and programs put in place to ensure that the situation remained under control. However, as a country, we continue to grapple with many health challenges in spite of the various interventions. One major concern is the rise in the incidence of cancers in the country. It is against this backdrop that I find the theme for this annual lecture, the epidemic of cancers in Ghana, improving access to prevention, early detection, and treatment, timely and refreshing, as it underscores the urgency and importance of addressing the issue comprehensively. Cancer has emerged as a significant public challenge in Ghana, affecting individuals across our society. The burden of this disease not only impacts the physical and emotional well-being of patients, but also has an impact on families. And it also places a significant strain on our healthcare system and the economy as a whole. It is imperative that we come together as a medical community, policymakers, researchers, and stakeholders to find sustainable solutions to this grow growing epidemic. As we gather here today, we have the privilege of hearing from our esteemed experts who will share their knowledge experience, and research findings. Your insights and recommendations undoubtedly will guide us in developing evidence-based strategies that can make a tangible difference in the lives of these, um, those diagnosed with cancer. Moreover, this public lecture provides a platform for dialogue and collaboration. And therefore, discussions we may through discussions we may identify the gaps in our current systems. You see, when you are described as quintessential, you don't know what to do. And then when you didn't bring your glasses with you to come and read the thing, you try and find light and then you read slowly. So uh, pardon me and uh, uh, endure the situation. As we gather here today, we have the privilege of hearing from esteemed experts who will 
share their knowledge, experiences, and research findings. Their insights and recommendations will undoubtedly guide us in developing evidence-based strategies that can make a tangible difference in the lives of those diagnosed with cancer. Moreover, this public lecture provides a platform for dialogue and collaboration. And through discussions, we may identify gaps in our current systems, explore innovative approaches, and work together to implement effective interventions. It is my fervent hope that at the end of this meeting, we are able to, one, raise awareness about the increasing prevalence of, con of cancers in Ghana. Two, that we improve access to prevention measures for cancer in Ghana. And three, we enhance early detection of cancer through education and screening. Four, that we also expand treatment options across and access to cancer care in Ghana. Five, that we address socio-cultural perspectives and challenges surrounding cancer prevention, detection, and treatment. And also provide psychosocial support for cancer patients and survivors in Ghana. Additionally, I believe this occasion offers as an opportunity to strengthen the bond between medical community, the medical community and the public. It is crucial that we are able to communicate effectively, disseminate accurate information to create awareness and prevention. By engaging the public, we can empower them in to take charge of their health, make informed decisions, and seek timely medical attention when needed. I therefore wish to encourage us all to, act, to actively engage in the lectures, panel discussions, and interventions, intervent, interactive sessions as our distribution, sorry, as our contributions are invaluable in shaping our collective response in the cancer epidemic. As stakeholders gathered here today, it is our expectation that we all have to bring our experiences, technical expertise to the fore. Let us identify where our strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities are, and draw pragmatic, practical solutions to overcome the challenges. Let's discuss issues dispassionately and welcome all ideas and suggestions. Distinguished guests, let me use this opportunity to assure you of government's avowed commitment to revamp and advance healthcare in Ghana. I have the conviction that through our individual and collective efforts, commitment and dedication, we can achieve the desired goal for the sector. On this note, I once again, and on behalf of the Honorable Regional Minister, welcome you all to this very important meeting and wish to extend my heartfelt appreciation to all members of the Ghana Medical Association and the organizing committee for making this even possible. I also wish to express my gratitude to the speakers and experts who are here today to generously share their expertise and insights. I therefore wish you all a fruitful and inspiring experience at the 23rd Ghana Medical Association Annual Public Lecture. Let us approach this annual lecture with a sense of purpose, collaboration, and determination to address the epidemic of cancers in Ghana. Together, we can make a difference in the lives of countless individuals. Thank you very much for your kind attention, for enduring me, and may God bless you all. Thank you very much. The Honorable MC and Regional Minister's representative. Ladies and gentlemen, this meeting is a meeting of who is who in the world of cancer. Uh, but the people are not malignant. 
So we are met here with a medical community, the pharmaceutical community, and uh, also uh, caregivers, patients, and also key community stakeholders. I like us to recognize the presence of students from the Nelson and Midrifi College of the Kolebu. Kolebu, Nelson, and Midrifi College. Let's let's see them. Please spare your eyes. Gallant young men and women who are going to take up the responsibility of leading the nursing charge in this country. Thanks for coming. Uh, may, may you stay. Ladies and gentlemen, it's difficult to progress without also recognizing the presence of uh, a man who became the face of the GMA in, uh, for quite some time during the heart of COVID. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the presence of our former General Secretary and now a uh, big man, Dr. Titus Bayou. Ladies and gentlemen, I had to invite him so that I can let him know that when he gets his one million, I like to be his. I like him to remember me. The program is made possible through the kind partnership of a world leading brand in healthcare. For many years, Rosh has been a pioneer and the provision of diagnostic and pharmaceuticals. And today, we are glad to have them once again partner with us to bring us this annual lecture. So it is fit and proper that we have Rosh deliver a few comments. Help me make welcome the Africa area head of Rosh Products, of Rosh limited um uh, i'll take time to get the name right this time because i've been doing some tutorials so let's welcome mr chumi machuri that no this one is for him but i appreciate the name how i got it right let's william you've done very well this time around let's give william a clap and a second louder one for Mr. Chumi, thank you. <laughs> thank you, William. You got my name right. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I think people always struggle with my first name, which you know I'm from Cameroon, and you know we got this French first name, which is Maturin, and every since I start working in Ghana in 1990, people call it Maturin, and my friend and colleague just make it Matt. Yeah, you can call me Matt, I think, without the double T, because there might be confusion. With Thank Matt. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, William. His Majesty, Honorables, the CEOs of teaching hospitals, dear chair, esteemed guests, doctor, nurses, and students to become nurses, communities, Colleague, actually, some of my colleagues at Roche should be the ones sitting here and talking to you because they have been the one alongside of you over years. They gave me the honor to be here and friends. I'm humbled and most grateful to be here with you today. I've been fortunate enough to be in Ghana this week. And I've been inspired by the engagement that I've had with most of healthcare professionals. Last night, I had the unique opportunity to learn from the CEOs of the Chichen Hospital what are the type of challenge they are going through, how they see healthcare in Ghana going forward, and what is their critical role. These are moments that helped me in my role as head of Africa at Roche to help my colleague in Ghana do what you need in order to make the place better for the patient. 
I know there's a lot of challenge, but I've always been impressed by how creative, innovative my colleague in Ghana and you find response to some of those challenges for the benefit of patients. And I will talk to some of them later today during my speech or during the, the panel. For those who are not familiar with Roche, in short, we advance science so that we all have more time with the people we love. We are driven by a vision of a healthier future. For 125 years, yes, is around, Roche is around for 125 years, we have taken on some of the most complex challenges in healthcare. We try to do this by listening and responding to the ever-changing needs of people around the world, which is why I'm very much, and I very much value the time I spend in Ghana this week. We focus on the long-term at Roche. We lead investment in research and development in the pharmaceutical field. Because we do our best to find what patients need next. And similarly, we do our best to make sure even patients living in resource-deprived country get what they need next. However, we cannot do this alone. And we do recognize that. To be successful, we need to collaborate. An example I would be humble to share with you is the memorandum of understanding we signed five years ago in Ghana to implement a national strategy for cancer control by working with some of you in this room so that some of the things we discussed during the team today will happen and be enhanced. Since the signing of this MOU, the Minister of Health through the NHI eh, has listed one of our medicine, acceptin, and MAPTERA to actually etc. matter as part of the benefit package for breast cancer and childhood cancer, respectively. The impact has been deep, huge. I was speaking to one of our clinical oncologists earlier this week from Kumasi, and she told me the story of this young lady in the 30, working for a bank, show up at her clinics, but could not afford this medicine. Her family was prepared to pay for one cycle, the bank was prepared to support for one cycle. But this happened at the time that the Minister of Health decided to make accepting free for most of the patients who need it in Ghana. Seven years down the line, she's still alive and she's seeing her kids growing. I think the purpose of the conversation today is to look at this type of example and see what might we do so that more of more this lady exists in Ghana and beyond. And that's one of the commitments that I keep giving to every stakeholder that I meet. We will do everything we can do so that we have more examples like this one. Not just to talk about, but also to ensure that we can learn from what's happened here. How did we manage to discuss with the medical community, how did we manage to discuss with the Minister of Health? How did we manage to discuss with the NHI to find this type of solution? To this point, this week alone, with the team in Ghana, our Roche team, I'm very proud of what you are doing. I met with Dr. Bernard Okoeboy of the National Health Insurance to discuss our joint partnership to make this type of thing happen. I'm delighted to tell you that NHI and Roche committed to strengthen our partnership by further collaborating so that more people can benefit of this type of situation. 
I'm totally conscious that we alone cannot do it. And we are also committed to share this story for, to more stakeholders so they can come and join us together. So more patients like the one that the clinical oncologist from Kumasi share with me happen. Expanding access to our medicine in Ghana and beyond is central to what we do. We passionately believe that our innovation do not matter if patients cannot access it. Our innovation will not matter if patient cannot access it. Our innovation will not matter if patient cannot access it. And that's what we believe. We should sit today with you and find a way we can make it matter for the patients. We are committed to partnering with government organizations and other stakeholders to ensure that universal healthcare coverage goals are met and exceeded. Because the little that we are doing can reach most of the people only when universal healthcare goal will be reached. And we are conscious with that. And we will be at the table anytime we are invited to bring our part of the solution to it. I will be participating in some of the panel today to discuss policy and financing mechanism. And I will join those conversations with open mind, learning from the challenge that you are solving, and go back home to our headquarters to share what I've learned in Ghana so that we can expand what we have started doing to Ghana to more patients, not only in Ghana, but on the continent. For now, thank you for welcoming me on the stage. I look forward to our time together today and to the partnership ahead. Thank you. Let's appreciate him one more time for the investments that they continue to make in the delivery of healthcare, particularly in oncology, we are grateful. Monsieur Maturan, merci beaucoup. Uh, that accent, I got it right this time. So you see, I just have to flip the switch and then it's, it's, it's correct. And the, the thing with the, the, our two guests from um, Rosh is that the, each of them have names that require an important attention to the phonetics and the pronunciations. Mm -hmm. And uh, for short, we have Matt and KG. <laughs> but not only do they have interesting names, their company also has an interesting uh, name to pronounce. Let's say Rosh. 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 And, and you would think that it is spelled with an R-U, isn't it? But this is R O C H E. R for Romeo, C for Oscar, C O for Oscar, C for Charlie, H for Hotel, E for Echo. You know, in Ghana, we have a way of customizing everything to our own taste. Mm -hmm. This international phonetic code, if you mention A, someone will tell you A is for what? Apple. But A is really alpha. <laughs> And B is what? B is beta. B is not for boy. <laughs> and certainly C is for C is for <laughs> is for Charlie and not Cat. But when you go to an interesting part of this country, A can be for Amango. <laughs> and you money. can even add Awaji. <laughs> We're joined by the vice president of the Ghana Medical Association. Let's appreciate the presence of our Vice President, Dr. Justice Yangson. Um, Rich, take over. So it's Rich and Will MCN, and as the name goes, he's the richer one. But when he, de he departs, he will, <laughs> he will will it. This guy, <laughs> you don't like peace. <laughs> like problems, eh? <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you. Vice President for gracing the occasion. We also have among us 
Madame Antoinette Bediaco Bowen, who is a senior lecturer at Medical, sorry, University of Ghana Medical School. Kindly give us a wave offering as the pastors say. We have her children who are the medical students with us. Kindly wave. If you don't wave, you'll get a referral. Uh, please stand and let's see you. If you stand, you have a credit already. Uh, future of uh, medical practice. Yes. As we said to the nurses, may you also stay. All right. So let, let the nurses also stand so that we can see them. And uh, you let them stand there. And so at the airport, we'll bounce them. Okay, when they are leaving. Um, we also have who have fought for them. Please, let's give them a big, a big salute when they stand up for us to see them. Cancer survivors who are among us here breasts any other cancers are you willing to wave thank you it takes it takes a lot of heart awesome. thank you awesome. 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 awesome 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 thank you very much for joining us it takes a lot of heart uh, we know in this country that sometimes people who have cancers are even stigmatized so for them to be able to stand up and even show their faces, they, that's a lot of courage. Uh, one more round of applause for them. Thank you. We would also acknowledge the presence of Madame Rose Oday, Program Head General Nursing at Nursing and, Tra Nursing and Midwifery Training College, Kolebu. Can you give us a wave of her? You know, where you see doctors, you must see nurses. So if we had not introduced her, we would have stopped the program right from there. At this juncture, we cannot come to the land, and then the owner will not say anything. Then we probably did not come. So at this juncture, uh, our Lord would want to say a few words to us and would like to invite his Royal Majesty, Noche Ni Note Owo the Fourth, Osumanche, to speak to us. Kindly, let's be upstanding. Ladies and gentlemen, let's rise to receive the King. Let the clap go until Noche gets to the stage. Thank you very much. Please sit. Ago, chame kenye me. Aga ago, nubo fan bo agba. Ago, chame kenye me. Mahan ye fen o manye. Chame kenye me fen you over here. Thank you so much for doing what you're doing, being here today. Uh, I will put away my tendencies as a lawyer and as a teacher, and I have no notes prepared, so this should be very brief. Uh, First of all, I'd like to acknowledge and congratulate and thank the Ghana Medical Association and all your members for what you continue to do for this country in this age of climate change and climate change related uh, effects on our healthcare systems. Being tasked to hold the fort in a developing country is no mere feat. And the fact that you do it and do it so well is something that we're all very proud of. We might not say it, and we might not show it sometimes when you show up in your, uh, your consulting rooms, but I assure you, we're all very thankful for what you continue to do. <laughs> Today, you've chosen to talk about cancer, and you've rightfully described it as an epidemic. For those of us who are in the communities, and we interact daily with the average Ghanaians, the average members of Cosmopolitan Accra, we know firsthand the effects it has in the communities. We, we recognize and see what poverty mixed with a lack of access to healthcare inflicts on families. Oftentimes we do our best to try and, you know, advocate and support as best as we can. However, 
it is up to you experts to lead the way and show us what to do and how ways we can help to stem the tide. If you go to the US, you go to Canada, you go to the United Kingdom, even in those countries where there's access to healthcare in higher forms than we do and there's more resources to go around, they still face a challenge. So if we're asked to do similar here in Ghana, we can only support you in this task. I'm delighted that there are young people here about to enter the professions and know the medical profession, both as doctors and nurses, who get to hear what you talk about today. So they get to see firsthand the challenges that await them. But I know for sure that if all of us here gathered in this room decide to put our shoulders into it, to gather our resources, both the private sector and the public sector, civil leaders, our dear mothers, caregivers, decide to champion the cause. We can stem the tide and have an effect. We can make sure that more people have more time to spend with their loved ones and their families, which in the end is all we want as people. Time to spend with those we love and hold dear. So as you gather here today for this lecture, I wish you the very best. I pray that God Almighty and our ancestors bless you and that whatever you decide to talk about today, whatever steps you decide to take today will go a long way. And very soon, we'll talk about the changes that started from this lecture. Thank you all very much. Shall we keep clapping for Nick? His Royal Majesty as he goes to sit. It is said that when you know what you want to say, you don't use too many words. And I think me, Note Owo the fourth Osumanche has said quite a lot. Deep words spoken in a calm manner with a sprinkling of the UK in, in it accent, you know? <laughs> and um, um, Osumanche, if you find me in your bedroom, it's not because of one million. I want to change my accent small, you know. <laughs> um, I could see how some people were staring nicely at you, but they don't look at me the same way. <laughs> it's not fair, but uh, I can't complain. Uh, if I try, I will be in jail. And um, it is also said that you should embrace your problems squarely, isn't it? And that is what GMA is doing by facilitating this. But a friend of mine, I don't know how the wife took this at a point. So the wife came to the husband, and the man was preaching, trying to be philosophical, and said, you know, we have to embrace these our problems in our home squarely. You know, we have to embrace it. We have to face it squarely and give a good future to our children. And then the wife just embraced the man. What is the meaning of that? <laughs> Uh, what, what is the meaning of that? They said you should embrace your problems squarely and deal with them. And then you just get up and embrace your husband. Um, I do not want to guess what is happening in their home right now. But I think it might be very peaceful. Ladies and gentlemen, at this juncture, we will dive deep. Uh, since the Osumanche has taking us to the beach. We now will dive deep into the waters. And this is where we get the keynote address on the theme of the occasion, which is the epidemic of cancers in Ghana. And we'll be talking about improving access to prevention, early detection, and treatment. And to do that, it's a very senior, 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 senior of mine. It's an associate professor of epidemiology and public health in the Department of Community Health, University of Ghana Medical School. He's the former head of Kolebu Cancer Registry. He's the fellow of the West Africa College of Physicians. He didn't stop there. He's also a fellow of the Ghana College of Physicians. He's the Christian medic. This part, he says, I should say, and he hasn't given the wife a hug yet. So you know what I mean. So he's still married <laughs> with three beautiful sons uh, boss you have to try for the fourth to, to add the female so let's all with a rousing welcome give a big round of applause to professor benedict 
ni laye kalis tego oh we can do it better let it let your palms sting you as he comes thank you prof Thank you very much for those kind words and good morning to everyone. Um, I would like to stand on the existing protocols. Your Majesty the Osu Manche, the Regional Minister's Representative, Deputy DG Ghana Health Service, Deputy CEO National Health Insurance Authority, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and let me also acknowledge my teacher and mentor, Emeritus Professor Richard Brichum. And I doff my hat off to all the cancer survivors who are here with us this morning. We are very grateful for you coming. I wish to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers for the privilege to deliver this keynote address. With the array of speakers we have lined up, I'm very sure that by the time we are done, we would all be very clear in our minds the state of cancers in Ghana and how we can improve access to prevention, early detection, and treatment. As you may all know, we are gathered here today to discuss a subject that affects all of us, either directly or indirectly. I'm sure each of us here is likely to have had a relative, a friend, or know somebody who has cancer. Cancers have been with us for a very long time, but unfortunately, the narrative is changing for the worse. Growing up, we were used to associate cancers with the elderly, people who were in their 60s, on retirement, etc. However, the same cannot be said of cancers today. As we have a lot more cases seen among individuals in the prime of their lives. And I'm sure you could tell from some of the survivors who stood up. And this is affecting productivity, both at the local, national, and international levels. And this is why I consider the theme for this public lecture to be very, very apt. The epidemic of cancers, improving access to prevention, early detection, and treatment. So let me just start by walking you through what cancers are. You could call it Cancer 101. When we look at the cause of any disease, it will generally, it will be described in a general perspective. And so it's often very hard to personalize it. In medical terminology, we refer to this as the natural history of the disease. So we are going to look at briefly the natural history of cancers. But when we talk about cancers, it makes more sense to talk of it in terms of stages and crossroads rather than just a linear evolution. So we would look at some crossroads because these crossroads are very critical points during the course of the disease which can produce very different outcomes and consequences. So broadly speaking, we have the following stages that can be identified throughout the course of a cancer. First, we have what we call the preclinical phase, where the individual has no symptoms, nothing to show that they have any problem. The cancer is silently developing in the background, and the time is variable depending on the type of cancer and the person involved. This may go on for some time, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, up to years. And this is where screening programs come in very handy. In fact, there are some cancers that never produce any clinical manifestation, no sign whatsoever. 
and the person will die with the cancer rather than from the cancer. So that's the first stage. Then we have what we call the pre-diagnosis symptomatic phase. Here, there is onset of symptoms. People are beginning to experience all sorts of symptoms, and the symptom is dependent on what type of cancer they may have. The location of the tumor plays a very significant role, and this may either aid in early detection or, contrastingly, may delay the diagnosis due to lack of specific symptoms. Then we have the third stage, which is the diagnosis phase. Here, the diagnostic procedures may be straightforward or complicated. In some cases, you'd have to conduct several tests to identify the tumor and confirm its staging. Staging is an important crossroad because it determines the most appropriate type of treatment. And then obviously we would move to the next phase, which is the treatment phase. It is generally corresponds to the standardized stage of the cancer. So the stage of the cancer determines what sort of treatment you would receive. But it's an important crossroad because it is subject to potential complications or crisis that may be associated with the actual treatment or as part of the evolution of the disease. And then we have the maintenance phase where the initial treatment is succeeded by a follow-up stage of varying stability. Here again, we may have crises which become evident through relapses, that is the appearance of the cancer or reappearance of the cancer following the treatment. Or maybe the result of the treatment which may be treatment-related complications. The crossroad after maintenance stage has two different pathways. People would either receive a cure or they move on to palliative care. If you receive a cure, then you are safe. If not, then we move on. Long-term survival, that's the next stage. So those who overcome the maintenance phase and receive cure have long-term survival, although the cancer for which they receive the treatment is con considered technically cured, they enter into a new chronic stage of life. And so cancer survivors subsequently have to deal with the after effects of the treatment. The long-term complication of these effects and sometimes the risk of developing another tumor. For those who do not receive cure and move into palliation, active cancer treatment is always combined with elements of palliative care that are applied more intensely in the advanced stages of the disease. The natural history of cancer is thus characterized by long periods of varying stability with some intercurrent crisis and end-of-life stages that last for a few weeks, months, or even years. Mr. Chair, before we proceed any further, we would want to address a very important question. Our theme talks about the epidemic of cancers. So the question is, do we really have an epidemic of cancers, or it's just a hype? This is a, a difficult question to answer, considering the fact that we do not have very reliable data in our part of the world, but we would make an attempt. So if we look at an epidemic, it is generally defined as having cases in excess of what you expect for that place at that time. Do we have excess of cancers? Let me make reference to the Global Can report for 2010, which are estimates for Ghana. And it tells us that these are adjusted for all other things, including age. <clears throat> As of 2010, for every 100,000 Ghanaians, we have about 109 of them suffering from one cancer or the other. Fast forward to 2020, same Global Can estimates 
Now that figure is about 125 for every 100,000 Ghanaians. So if we work with a population of 31 million, then we are looking at 38,750 new cases. These are estimates for new cases, not the total burden. So what it means is that every year we are having close to 40,000 new cancer cases, as opposed to 27,000 10 years ago. Do we have an epidemic or not? You be the judge. But I think this, the figures speak for themselves. On the face of the pink sheet, it is very obvious that we have a looming crisis on our hands. Now, to put the Ghanaian cancer situation in its proper context, let's look at some key figures about cancers as provided by the World Health Organization. So cancers are the second leading cause of death worldwide, accounting for nearly 10 million deaths every year. And these are figures from GlobalCon 2020. When you come to low and middle income countries where Ghana belongs, we tend to shoulder most of the cancer burden. So if you look at the 10 million deaths every year, 70% of them are in low and middle income countries. Now this disparity is even more striking in the case of cervical cancer, where 90% of new cases and deaths from this preventable cancer occur in low and middle income countries. The cancer incidence in sub-Saharan Africa is projected to increase by more than 92 percent between 2020 and 2040. So almost a hundred percent increase. And some projections have even said that by that time we are more likely to have more cases of cancer than that of TB, malaria, and HIV pulled together. And if you think that these are the major problems we have, and we'll be having more cases of cancer. That's something that we need to really work on. And that is why this theme is very apt. If we look at the extent of the problem globally, the common cancers are breast, lung, colon, rectum, and prostate cancer. These are global figures. And if you look at the 2020 report, there were over 2.2 million new cases of breast cancer worldwide. <clears throat> Lung cancer, 2.21, colon and rectum, 1.9 million, prostate, 1.4, skin, 1.2, and stomach, 1 million. New cases of cancers. When it comes to death from cancers, lung cancer tops the list globally, 1.8 million, followed by the colon and rectum, 916,000, liver, 830, Stomach 769, and then breast 685,000. You'd realize that at the global level, cervical cancer does not even feature in the list. But when we come closer home, it is one of our big problems. So let's get closer home and look at the cancer burden in Ghana. And here I'm looking at a five year prevalence. Breast cancer tops the list. For every 100,000, Ghanaians, about 66 of them would have breast cancer. So that brings it, if you work with 31 million, you are talking about over 20,000 breast cancer cases. Then it is followed by cervical cancer, which doesn't appear at the global level because it's a preventable disease, but we are still battling with it. And it's number two. For every 100,000, we have about 39 people with cervical cancer. Then prostate cancer, followed by cancer of the ovary, and then that of the liver. So these are the overall five-year prevalence. That's total burden. When we look at the new cases, again, in the estimates we had, we had 24,000 new cancer cases, as per the 2020 report. And for our childhood cancers, on the average, we are having about 400 new cases annually. These are estimates, bear that in mind. And the common leading ones for the males, liver, prostate, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, colorectal, and then stomach. 
For the females, it's the breast, cervix, ovary, liver, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And for our children, it's the Wilms tumor, the retinoblastoma, the leukemias, and the lymphomas. These are the common problems we have. When we look at mortality from cancers, Globocon estimates that every year in Ghana, we have about 15,000 people dying from cancers. And just in case you are, you are having a difficulty visualizing 15,000, I'm sure we've all seen aeroplanes. And we all know what happens when we hear of a road traffic accident involving, let's say, a U-turn bus, and you are told everybody on board died. What's your reaction? Oh. Now, if you want to visualize 15,000, it's like having 25 A-Bus 380 aircrafts. You know the huge ones? Each of them carries on average 600 passengers. And it's like having 25 of them crashing with all passengers on board dying every year. So on average, we have two crashes every month. Just visualize that. How many deaths do we get from COVID? As at the end of March, it was about 1,400, less than 1,005. But I'm sure you all know the frantic measures we put in to deal with COVID. Why are we not making such noise about cancers? The answer is very simple. We are not angry enough. And why are we not angry enough? Because we don't have the information. Awareness creation is one of the big challenges that we have. So my aim this morning is to make you very angry by the time you leave here. Angry enough to make noise about cancers. Angry enough to be willing to go to development partners and make noise. Angry enough to prioritize it and move it from the back burner to the front bench for discussion. What are some of the risk factors? What are the causes of cancers? Cancers will generally arise from transformation of normal cells. You know, the, generally the body would replace cells that are wearing off and dying. Now, when this multiplication or replication goes wrong, then we can have cancer. So in that multi-stage process, changes can happen, things can go wrong, and we can have what we call precancerous lesions. And these will progress to become malignant tumors. These changes are usually the result of the interaction between a person's genetic factors and at least three categories of external agents. Now, these external agents are the physical cancer causing agents, what we call carcinogens, such as ultraviolet and ionizing radiation. Then we can talk about the chemical carcinogens, components of tobacco smoke, alcohol, aflatoxins, which is a food contaminant, and arsenic, which is a water contaminant, and also asbestos. And then we can have the biological carcinogens, such as infections from certain viruses, bacteria, or other parasites. When we look at the exposure to radiation, it's much closer to us than before. I mean, just looking around the room, I believe everybody has a cell phone or two. Some are closely packed in our pockets. Others are in our breast pockets. In addition to our mobile phones, we have tablets. We have laptops, iPods, iPads, all sort of gadgets. All right. There are some schools of thought that have suggested associations between radiations from these gadgets and cancer causation. However, current available evidence does not support this. That doesn't leave us off the hook. The reason being that much research is needed in these areas. Cancer, um, these mobile devices have not been with us for that long, and we cannot tell the long-term effect of these things, so we need to tread cautiously. So we can start by keeping our phones away from our bodies as much as possible. And please, don't put it under your pillow when you are sleeping. 
Uh, some of us, if somebody sees the contents of our phone, when their phone rings, it's like we are possessed. Please keep it away. And then tobacco. Tobacco use, it, this cannot be overemphasized. It's long been identified as a major risk factor for cancer development. And tobacco smoke is made up of thousands of chemicals, of which at least 70 are known to cause cancers. And in this regard, some, you know, the youth of today think that shisha is a way out. So let me, let me bust your bubble. Shisha is very trending among the youth now, especially the females. And it is no less harmful than cigarette smoking. In fact, in a shisha session, which usually lasts for 20 to 80 minutes, a shisha smoker can inhale the same amount of smoke as a cigarette smoker consuming 100 sticks of cigarettes. Yes, you heard me right, 100 sticks. So in case you were thinking shisha is a safe option, passing it through water doesn't make it any less harmful. Also, the amount of aldehyde compounds, some of these carcinogens, carbon monoxide and tar, that is found in one shisha smoking session is four to 30 times more than in a single session of cigarette smoking. And these are potential carcinogens, making reference to the aldehyde, the carbon monoxide, and the tar. And they, have, they combine with other toxic substances. Let's talk about alcohol. Hello? Mr. Chair, anytime we talk about alcohol, there is controversy because people like the green bottle. You know, eh, people like it. It's, and it's even evident by the adverts we see around. I mean, just tune on your radio or your TV and you hear of from one bitters to the other. At the last count, I counted about 71 and I lost count. New ones keep coming up. Uh, I hear that the latest one is Walat. Walat and Walas. I don't know which one is coming next. But alcohol... Consumption is another major risk factor for cancer development. And this is evident from the high patronage that the numerous alcoholic beverages and bitters receive. The fact, however, remains that alcohol is classified as a group one carcinogen. It's in the same category as tobacco. And group one simply means that there is enough evidence to conclude that it causes cancer. So whether we feel comfortable or not, alcohol is a risk factor. And it does this largely through its toxic product, the acetal acetaldehyde, which damages cells and causes them to re replicate incorrectly. It also influences the level of certain hormones, which can modify how cells grow and divide. Alcohol also exerts its effect on the liver and it's a major contributor to liver cancers. If you looked at what we mentioned for Ghana, liver cancers were, was one of the top ones. Then we talk about water pollutants. And of concern in recent times are arsenic and mercury. These chemicals have become major pollutants of our water bodies as a result of the proliferation of galamse activities in our country. And let me mentioned that Galamse poses an existential threat. It's a threat to our very existence. All of us are at risk. And it results in heavy metal pollution of our water bodies. Mercury is a product used in the extraction process, whilst arsenic is a byproduct. And Methyl mercury, which is a compound of mercury, has been classified as possibly carcinogenic by the International Agency for Research on Cancers. While arsenic and its compound, as well as its presence in water, have been classified as carcinogenic by the same institution. And this is another reason why we must all take a stand against Galamse. It's not just about those out there. 
if we don't take that stand, very soon we'll start importing water. Because all our water bodies will be polluted with arsenic. And we are not sure what will happen to us and our future generations. So let's take a stand. If you think you are in Accra, so you are not affected. You know, these chemicals are carried on in the food chain. So I was talking to Matt earlier, and he was telling me he enjoys his tilapia soup. Very soon, that tilapia will be contaminated with mercury. So you are sitting at Mervyn Peak eating your grilled tilapia, but you are eating mercury from Takwa. And so we all need to be involved. The incidence of cancers also rise dramatically with age, most likely due to a buildup of risk factors and specific cancers that increase with age. The overall risk accumulation is combined with the tendency for cellular repair mechanism to be less effective as we grow. Then we have the cancer-causing infections, such as the human papilloma virus, and then hepatitis B and C, helicobacter pylori, the Epstein-Barr viruses. And these are together responsible for approximately 30% of cancer cases in our part of the world. Hepatitis B and C obviously are a risk for liver cancer, while the HPV, human papilloma virus, is a risk for cervical cancer. Infection with HIV increases your risk of developing cervical cancer by sixfold, and it substantially increases the risk of developing other cancers such as Kaposi sarcoma. Our current lifestyles add to the trouble. We have increasing levels of physical inactivity. Uh, technology is not helping us. So now you can sit at one point and with a remote, turn on the lights in your house, turn off the TV, turn on the AC. Very soon, AI will help us to dish food and, and we'll have to even go to the kitchen. So now we have to make a conscious effort to incorporate physical activity into our daily living. High body mass index. You know, in our part of the world, uh, it's nice to look nice, especially when you have rounded curvatures. They say you need to have something to hold. So it's a sign that your husband or wife is taking good care of you. As soon as you become tingilingi, people start asking, ah, is, is he not taking good care of you? But high body mass index is a risk factor and so is our low intake of fruits and vegetables. And when it comes to cancer deaths, one third of deaths from cancers are due to tobacco use, high body mass index, alcohol consumption, low fruit and vegetable intake, and lack of physical exercise. So we see, how do we reduce the cancer burden? Generally speaking, about a third of all cancers are preventable. Another third can be cured. And the last third are amenable to palliation. So cancer follows the rule of, or the rule of thirds. So if we look at that, if we are able to avoid the risk factors or reduce these risk factors, and we add early detection to it, and prompt treatment, close to 70% of all cancers that we encounter can either be prevented or cured. And this is the window of hope. So how do we prevent it? There are various measures. At the primary level, I realize that the biggest challenge is lack of awareness lack of awareness. So if we want to prevent cancers, we need to start by making noise. Get angry enough to make noise. You know, I remember the 2014 when we had Ebola in our neighboring countries. We made so much noise that even the traders on the road, they were educating people. Some were calling it Deborah and Ebola and whatever. But at least they knew there was something. Let's make noise to the point where the ordinary person on the street can tell you about cancers. Let's create awareness. How can we do that? 
we can have dedicated months. For some of the cancers, we already have dedicated months. Um, January, they say, is cervical cancer. But how many of you knew that March was dedicated to rectal cancer? No, we don't. How many of us know that April is dedicated to pharyngeal cancer? These are international months that are dedicated to these cancers. Can we make a lot more noise about them? May is for skin cancer. September is for prostate cancer. October is for breast cancer. November is for lung cancer. And we can go on and on and on. Let's make noise. Let's create awareness. Then there are the cancer ribbons. Different colors signifying the different type of cancers. I'm sure you all know about pink October. But how many of you know about light blue? What does it signify? Prostate. So you see, when you see somebody with a light blue ribbon, and, and then the teal or white is for cervical cancer, orange is for leukemia, and so on and so forth. Let's make noise. Let's create awareness about this. And in this regard, I'm expecting that the Health Promotion Division of Ghana Health Service would collaborate more effectively. I know they are collaborating, but they should collaborate more effectively with a non-communicable control program to create the needed awareness as a first step to cancer prevention. We can go on and even use brand ambassadors for the various concepts. Um, I'm sure you, you've heard about the, the, the Shatter movement. Imagine what will happen if we make Shatawale a brand ambassador for prostate cancer. I mean, the fact that you belong to the Shatter movement alone. Uh, we have the, the uh, there's, which other one? Beam Nation, right? And then there's success. I'm sure you know them. Imagine what we can do if we incorporate these brand ambassadors. You know, the music industry is a, a viable one, and we can leverage on their celebrity status to create awareness for cancers. Another preventive measure is that of vaccination for those for which there are vaccines. HPV the human papilloma virus. There are vaccines, and that can help reduce cervical cancer, which is one of the topmost on the list, vaginal cancers, vulva cancers, and anal cancers. You know, these days, issue of sexuality is some way. Uh, that's a discussion for another day. <laughs> then there, are, there is also a vaccine against hepatitis B. Let's take advantage of these vaccines. Another primary reduction measure is that of reducing our risk, the risk factors. So can we avoid tobacco smoke? You may not be the primary smoker, but secondary smoking is as harmful as primary, if not worse, because you are taking in all the harmful carcinogens in addition to what the primary smoker is bringing out. Can we avoid tobacco? Can we work towards maintaining a healthy body weight? It's good to have it rounded, but let it be in proportion to your health. Can we establish healthy eating habits? Incorporating more fruits and vegetables. Fortunately for us, we have a lot of these things that are in seasons. They come in season. So if it's watermelon season, please enjoy the melon. If it's orange, you don't need to go and look for apple. We were brought up to know that an apple a day keeps the doctor away. An orange a, do, a day can do the same. So can mango a day. All right, so let's patronize what is in season. Usually when they are in season, they are less expensive. Our mothers here can tell you. They are the ones on the market. You know, so can we have a conscious plan to engage in physical activity where we are looking at a work-based or a school-based approach? such that employees or and employers can have a place where employees can exercise either before or after work rather than spending three hours in traffic. If you use one hour of that time to exercise, by the time you get home, you'll still be tired anyway, but then tired with benefits. Can we avoid or reduce our alcohol consumption? These are some of the risk factors reductions that we can adopt. Then it comes to the secondary prevention measures. We are looking at screening and early detection. 
And screening aims to identify individuals with findings that are suggestive of a specific cancer or pre-cancer lesion before they develop symptoms. When these abnormalities are identified, further tests to establish a definitive diagnosis should follow. And this should be linked to a referral center if it is proven to be cancer. The patient selection for screening program is usually based on age and risk factors. So it's good to screen everybody, but at the same time, you have to balance it with the capacity of the health system. Otherwise, you would overwhelm the system and it will come crashing down. So we need to find a, a fine balance. So we have screening programs for HPV, and now we are recommending more of the HPV DNA. If you are negative, there are vaccines available. We have mammography for screening breast cancer for women who are aged 40 and above, or those with strong family history. And there are others when it comes for screening. But quality assurance is required both for screening and early diagnosis programs. When identified early, cancer is more likely to respond to treatment and can result in a greater probability of survival with less morbidity, as well as less expensive treatment, which is very important. Significant improvements can be made in the lives of cancer patients by detecting cancer early and avoiding delays in care. When we look at the early diagnosis component, we can identify three components of this. Number one is being aware of the symptoms. So people need to be made aware of the symptoms of the different forms of cancers and of the importance of seeking medical advice. Unfortunately, majority of our patients present late. It doesn't matter which type of cancer we, we look at. Majority of our patients present late. And because they are presenting late, the outcome is usually not very good. And that serves as a deterrent for other people who are diagnosed with cancer because they then see it as a death sentence. I mean, interacting with women in Jamestown, they will tell you, once you go to the hospital with cancer, they are going to cut off your breast. And as soon as they do that, you will die. And that is because people come at very late stages. But if we can pick it up early, if we can create the needed awareness, then we can change that narrative. So we need to work on creating awareness. Then the second component is access to clinical evaluation and diagnostic services. Using our primary healthcare approach, we have to build the capacity of all cadre of healthcare workers, especially those at the periphery. You know, the specialized care would be at the tertiary and referral centers. But most people would go to the CHIPS centers. They would go to the polyclinics. They would go to the health centers. That's their first point of call. And we need to build capacity at these places so that they can detect and then link these people to care. It is not rocket science to be able to use acetic acid, visual inspection with acetic acid to pick up precancerous cells of cervical cancer. And at the same time, it is easy to use either self-breast examination or clinical examination to pick up lumps that may be pointers to breast cancer. And here, I would like to pay glowing tribute to one of our colleagues, Dr. Kofi Ifa and his team at Bator. They are doing a yeoman's job. They are using what we call the hub and spoke approach. So they have a center in Bator, and they have trained people at the periphery. And they are trying to expand, but they cannot do it alone. And so I would want to entreat all stakeholders to think of how we can replicate this in other parts of the country. Then the third component is the timely referral to treatment services. People are screened, they are identified as having cancers, and between the time of diagnosis till they get to a referral center for definitive treatment, many of, get, of them get lost in transit for various reasons. 
Sometimes it takes several months, and in some extreme cases, years after an initial, initial positive screening or diagnostic result for these patients to be linked to care at an appropriate referral center. The reasons are multifaceted. Lack of communication between the various levels of healthcare. Another big monster is the funding for cancer care. Cancer treatment is expensive. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Then we also have the skewed distribution of our health facilities and our health workforce. Especially those that are involved in comprehensive cancer care. And there is the ignorance and fear on the part of our patients. Cancer programs should be designed such that they would reduce the delays in and the barriers to diagnosis, treatment, and supportive care. When it comes to prompt treatment, a correct diagnosis of cancer is essential for appropriate and effective treatment because every cancer type requires a specific treatment regimen. These treatments would usually include surgery, radiotherapy, and or what we call the systemic therapy like chemotherapy, hormonal treatments, or targeted biological therapies. The proper selection of a treatment regimen takes into consideration both the cancer and the individual being treated. Completion of the treatment protocol in a defined period of time is important to achieve the predicted therapeutic result. Now, determining the goals of treatment is an important first step. The primary goal is generally to cure the cancer or to considerably prolong life. Improving the patient's quality of life is an important goal, and this can be achieved by support for the patient's physical, psychosocial, and spiritual well-being and palliative care in terminal stages of cancer. Some of the most common cancer types, such as the breast cancer, cervical cancer, oral cancer, and colorectal cancer, have cure, they have high cure probabilities when detected early. Again, the catch here is early detection. So when detected early and treated according to best practices, the cure rate is high. Some cancer types, such as testicular seminomas and different types of leukemia and lymphomas, have high cure rates if the appropriate treatment is provided, even when the cancerous cells are present in other body parts. Let me talk about a very important area, financing of cancer care. When it comes to financing cancer care, this is a major challenge. Currently, we have some options available the national health insurance. In recent times, childhood cancers have been brought on board. And this takes care of about 60% of the common childhood cancers we have. This is good in theory, but we have a challenge on the ground. You know, most of the cancer drugs are very expensive. And if we would be fair to ourselves, we are not paying realistic premiums. And therefore, the health insurance is not paying realistic tariffs. The monies that they reimburse these pharmaceutical companies with sometimes are much lower than the actual cost of the drugs. And therefore, there are many pharmacies that refuse to sell these prescriptions when they are presented on the ticket of national health insurance. So even though on paper, National Health Insurance is taking care of these cancers. In practice, on the ground, these patients are not benefiting because the pharmacies will not dispense it because they risk running at a loss. Let's look at it. What can we do about our National Health Insurance? You cannot continue adding on without increasing the sources of income. Can we think of having a tier system where rather than the basic premium, some premiums are as low as 24 CDs. I don't know what 24 CDs can do a year. But those are the premiums you and I are paying. 
some pay 72 CDs, and we expect to get quality cancer care. Can we think of having a tier system where beyond this basic, just like we have for private insurance, those who are willing to get additional services should be willing to pay an additional premium so that we have enough revenue coming in. It's something that we can think about. The out-of-pocket payment still exists. And where the individual does not have that muscle, then we resort to social support groups. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of those social support groups. Help needed. And then it goes on social media, people raise funds. I'm aware that the cancer fund has been proposed by the non-communicable disease. But this is yet to be approved. Please, those who have the power to make it happen, let it happen. Because without this, all the noise we are making will not go anywhere. When people are diagnosed and they don't have the capacity, it will be back to square one. The final thing I would want to talk about before I take my seat is that on cancer registration. Cancer registries are an essential part of any rational program to control cancers. And I'm sure you may be aware that there have been several attempts at having cancer registries in this country. Some started before I was born. But it was not until recently, 2010 thereabout, that we started having functional cancer registries. I am told that there are five cancer registries in the country. That in Kumasi, Kolibu, Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, Ho Teaching Hospital, and Tamale. I am not sure the levels at which these registries are. But on record, it's only the Kolibu and Konfanochi ones that are population-based. In other words, they are not collecting data only from the hospital, but they are looking at what happens in our communities. And when it comes to estimates for Ghana, unfortunately, it is only the Kumasi registry that is currently recognized by the Association for Cancer Registries. So all the estimates we are having for Ghana are based on data from the Kumasi Registry. So you can appreciate why it's underestimated because they cannot be everywhere at every time. And so cancer registry takes money. We need to put our money where our priorities are. If we are not getting the data, we will not be able to manage the cancers well. We will not be able to make the right projections and we'll deal with estimates, estimates, estimates. With all the expertise we have in Ghana, I don't see why GlobalCon should still be modeling cancer statistics for us. We should be able to generate our own data. And if we are able to have these registries functioning at all our regional hospitals using the same software, then it only becomes a matter of collating their information at a central location. And then we have a national cancer registry. It is possible. Countries like Zimbabwe have done it. And we say we are richer than them. Countries like Uganda have done it right here in Africa. So it is not beyond us. Let us just get angry enough. And let's put our money where our priorities are. So Mr. Chair, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, cancers are assuming an alarming proportion of morbidity and mortality, especially in our part of the world. We cannot continue to sit and wait for solutions from donors as usual. To a large extent, we have the men and women with the requisite skills and expertise to control cancers. What is lacking is adequate funding and political will adequate funding, and I'm re-echoing I'm re this, so that all the, the, the partners and stakeholders would go home with that. Government should take the lead by priority, prioritizing cancer control in its budget. I would be glad to see a line for cancer management or cancer control when that budget for Ministry of Health is approved. As a nation, we always find money to organize by elections whenever the need arises, whether it was in the budget or not, because we do not want to derail the democratic process. Let us attach the same importance to healthcare in this country. 
and particularly to cancer control. Thank you very much. Wow, wow, wow. I think a, a standing ovation is appropriate. Uh, Professor Carlos Tego, you, you've earned it. Thank you so much for such an erudite delivery. Uh, I, I guess you probably saved this for your inaugural professorial <laughs> lecture uh, when you're admitted to the uh, Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, we'll keep we'll keep this uh, presentation. But this was well researched, well presented. Thank you so much for engaging us in this stimulating journey for cancer A to Z. We had it all covered, and then just for flair, he threw in his expertise and knowledge in aircraft and air, air machinery, air buses, and all of that. But folks, he's laid it out there, the things that we need to be minded and guided about, the weight, excess weights, the, the phones and the way we use them, the cigarettes, and particularly the creeping uh, problem with shisha, especially in our youthful com um, members of our community. Uh, know that if cigarette is a devil, shisha is a wet devil. At this juncture, um, we were joined by our, our His Royal Majesty Ni Noti Owu the Fourth. Um, he has been with us for a while, but we are given to understand that other matters require his attention, and so he would have to kindly take leave of us for res giving respect to his office. Uh, would like to thank him so much for his presence at this opening and also for the uh, welcome that he delivered. And we would stand as he takes leave of us. Thank you so much. His Royal Ma Majesty Noche Ni Noti Owu the Fourth. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Please resume your seats. A few quick introductions, and then we'll get to the second segment after a musical interlude. We're joined this morning by the Greater Accra Regional Director of Health Services. She is in the person of Dr. Mrs. Charity Sapong. Let's welcome her. If, if beauty were an album, hers will be titled Timeless. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when I'm, when I'm, I'm appreciating my boss, let me do that. <laughs> All right. And we're also joined by C COP retired Ebenezer Ewisi Emimi. He is a former president of the GMA and a fellow of the GMA, former host director of the police hospital. Doc, thanks for joining us. We also have the distinguished presence of Dr. Kwame Amponsa Achiano, program manager, EPI, Ghana Health Service. 
And we're joined by the president of the Pediatric Society of Ghana, um, a professional affiliate group uh, of GMA. Let's welcome its president, Dr. Hilda Mantibia Foy. We also have to acknowledge the presence of the Deputy Director of the National Radiotherapy and Oncology and Nuclear Medicine Center, Kolebu. She herself, a pioneer oncologist in Ghana, Professor Vena Vanderpoy. Thank you, Prof. Let's also acknowledge the presence of the Deputy CEO of the Mental Health Authority, Dr. Caroline Randolph Emisa. And not to be left out, although our speaker um, did this acknowledgement, it's not very often that we are joined by such greatness. A man who has contributed to medical education in many respects and for many years. Let's acknowledge once more the presence of the veritable Emeritus Professor Richard Brichum. <laughs> Prof, thanks for coming. And thanks for your contributions to medical education and public health in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take the mu a spot of musical interlude as we transition to have the second segment of presentations. So you thought it's true When I make you all the sin I'm talking about a lifetime plan That's the way to begin. We're hand in hand, and Glenn Miller's band was a bit. Hello. Um, there's water at the back. So, just in case you need to take a sip, please feel free to do so. The washrooms are when you go to the foyer, you take a right, another right again. And look closely on the, on the panels. The way it is, if you don't take it, you might think it's a wall. And then you, you can uh, make yourself comfortable. Thank you. We'll be right back. Uh, the music is not coming in. Eh? William wants to sing that.
to our second second session for today in our session two we'll be taking some presentations we'll be looking at cancers in females cancers in males and childhood cancers Before I invite the first presenter who would be touching on cancers in females, um, I recognize the presence of the uh, pediatric intensivist at our Greater Accra Regional Hospital. Let's appreciate the presence of Dr. Kil Charlene Kilber. All right. And then I also noticed um another pediatrician with the Kolebu Teaching Hospital Unit, um, Dr. Gladys Lomote. All right, we'll do some more introductions as we get on, but we would like to get the sessions underway. So delivering on topic one, cancers in females, we have a consultant gynecologist, gynecology oncologist, a senior lecturer in obstetrics and gynecology at the Comfornochi Teaching Hospital School of Medical Sciences, KNUST. Ladies and gentlemen, with a round of applause, let's welcome Dr. Thomas O. Connie. Doc, you're welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to talk on cancers in females. I've been told to avoid the medical jargons. So I'm going to keep it in plain language as much as possible. And when necessary, I may have to speak my local language down. When we want to look at cancers in females, we should be able to know that we have the breast, which everybody can see. But unfortunately, the other cancers in females, is very difficult to see these organs. For that reason, it makes it very difficult when it comes to diagnosis. So when we look at all this, the three most common cancers in the females are the breast, the cervix, and the ovary. And I'm sure most of us have not seen the ovary, but I'll be able to show you this shortly so that we appreciate where these cancers in the females are. And when we talk about cancers, these are abnormal growth of cells uh, in the body that can affect any part of the body. Um, the first speaker, our keynote speaker, mentioned the fact that almost all our patients come in late uh, when there's very little that we'll be able to do for them. So the breasts we have seen, but when we look at the other reproductive tract, that is, that will form what the female cancers are, we have... On the left, the womb also can get a cancer. Behind them, alongside the womb, we have what we call the tubes. 
and then we have the ovary. The tube can develop cancer. The ovary can develop cancer. Then we have the vagina, which can also develop cancer. The cervix can develop cancer. And then even outer area before one gets into the vagina, that is the vulva, this can also develop cancer. So all these areas will form what we are going to talk about. But because we don't have so much time, we'll concentrate on two common female cancers. The breast and then the cervix. And in fact, of all the cancers that I mentioned, there are screening methods for the first two. And unfortunately, the first two where we have screening are the leading causes for cancers uh, in the females. So in Ghana, we registered 2,900 total deaths due to breast cancer. There are different parts of the breast that the, the cancer can develop from. So we have a place where breast milk is produced, and then another area that will transmit the breast milk to the nipple. And these two areas are where mostly we have the cancer developing. So I've been told to put on some break because we are expecting some more people in because this is a very top, important topic. So a short break.
we we're going to have um, Dr. Thomas Con resume the presentation. We had him pause because um, he's speaking about female cancers in females, and a significant portion of the guests we invited to hear this message were outside. So, Dr. Connie, sir, uh, carry on with the education. Welcome back from the break. Um, there was a pause. I thought we were going to do some rewind. But I'll, do, I'll go ahead, then we'll continue from here, uh, where we stopped. That breast cancer is the leading cause when we look at female cancers, or um, cancers in females. This is followed by breast um, service, and then the ovary that order although this is not in competition it is just to alert us or let us know that the leading cause of uh, the leading cancer in females is breast followed by cervix and then the ovary when cancer develops in the breast it may only be localized that means it should be just in the breast but with time this cancer can progress from the breast to any other parts of the body. So there are some risk factors for breast cancer. And these risk factors, we say they are not modifiable. So age, as one ages, one cannot modify it. But we know that breast cancer tends to develop in females or women who are aging. For that reason, age is a non-modifiable factor. There's nothing we can do about that. And then if the woman has a personal history of breast cancer, or she has a family history, the mother had breast cancer, or the auntie, or any close relative had breast cancer, this is a very big risk factor uh, when it comes to breast cancer. And then we have some genetic mutation that can run in families. These ones we want, will not be able to do anything about. And sometimes even in treating some forms of cancers with radiation, a woman can also develop uh, the cancer. So these are risk factors that the woman cannot do anything about. But of course, there are factors that the woman will be able to modify to reduce the risk. And these factors are, yes, after Giving birth, the woman should breastfeed and not withhold the breastfeeding because we know that breastfeeding is going to protect the woman from breast cancer. We talk about excess weight. This can be modified. And then not getting enough exercise. So if one is not exercising, one is more likely to be uh, putting on weight. And of course, drinking alcohol. This can also be modified. So in reducing the risk for breast cancer, all the modifiable things that we talked about, that is in the hands of the woman, and this can be done. These two cancers that we'll be talking about, breast and cervix, I mentioned the fact that these are the cancers that we have screening for. And unfortunately, these are leading cancers in the females. So there is the breast cancer screening, and here we are looking at breast self-awareness or self-breast examination. The woman can actually do this breast examination herself, and most often what we recommend is soon after the menses, when the breast is not too painful, one could develop, just get a date in the calendar, stand before the mirror, look at the breast and see whether there are any changes 
and then run your fingers along the breast to feel for any lumps uh, that may be possible there. And if one should find something that one does not understand, that is the best time to see the health worker. So this the woman can do herself every once every month. Or if the woman cannot do it herself or she even does it, she comes to the clinic and then we are going to do the clinical breast examination. This examination is done by the health worker. And then we can go on to do the x-ray, which is the mammography, and that is going to detect whether there are any lesions or uh, lumps in the breast. And in some occasions, uh, we only use the uh, MRI. So this is teaching us how to do the breast self-examination. We have the calendar and every woman can choose a particular date or a particular day soon following the menstrual cycle or the menses or the period and then do this examination. When we talk about the mammography, it is something that is painless. There's no pain attached. You're just taking a picture that this is an X-ray and that takes the picture and it shows whether there are any areas that are of concern uh, to be treated. There are warning signs and this should alert every woman that what I'm seeing is not something that is usual, for which reason I have to see the uh, a health worker. So anytime the woman does the breast self-examination, feels a lump, or sometimes even looking at the breast in the mirror, you see that there are some changes occurring. Okay, occasionally, you may have the nipple where the milk comes out from. Usually, it stands out. But when you look at it and you see that it is moving inwards, it is cause for concern, and this should be a warning sign. Or sometimes even seeing that there is some ulcer on the breast. You may also have areas that even there is some discharge coming from where the breast is supposed to come from. And this could be blood or any other thing else. In any case, we have to do the diagnosis. And here, ultrasound, which is also painless, this can also be used to diagnose the breast cancer. The mammogram, as I mentioned earlier, and then the magnetic resonance image. But actually, to see whether what you are feeling is cancer, what we do is what we call the biopsy. The biopsy is to take a tissue or fluid that will be used for analysis, and then the diagnosis of cancer uh, will be made. For every cancer, we need to stage. And the staging is to see how far the cancer has spread. Is the, the, the cancer in the breast, or it has moved beyond the breast, sometimes even to the armpit, and even beyond. So that is how we do the staging. And once we know the stage, then we know the appropriate treatment uh, to give. And if the cancer is only in the breast, then we say it's early disease. And the early we detect these diseases, the best treatment and cure can be given. It's for that reason we are looking at early detection that will promote uh, the better or the best of treatments uh, for our women. So we talked about this on the far left, that is the mammogram. That is how the picture looks like. And it's the breast and the areas in red are showing that there is something going on in there that needs to be evaluated. Once we have diagnosed, we need to treat. And previously, as um, the keynote speaker mentioned, 
that people were afraid that once you get the breast cancer, you are going to have an operation and then soon you are going to die. But the major thing is once we are able to detect this very early, then we can put in the measures uh, to treat. Surgery, that is operation, has a role, very much role to play when it comes to breast cancer. And it does not always involve the removal of the whole breast. Sometimes even the lump alone can be removed and the breast is conserved. Sometimes we even need to excise or take out an area of the breast and conserve the breast. And depending on how far the disease has traveled beyond the breast, then we are going to add on radiation therapy and also add on the medicine that one has to take or is passed through the, the veins. This is what we call the systemic uh, treatment. So this is a woman who has had partial mastectomy. So the breast has been conserved. It's the area that had the disease that had been taken off. Now we move on to cervical cancer and I'll run through this um, quickly. All right, so as we're getting the slides ready, uh, cervical cancer is second to breast cancer. And what I'll say about cervical cancer is that I will say the good Lord has been merciful and graceful to us because it is one of the cancers that we can detect early. In fact, it has an infectious stage. So one will acquire infection and if the infection should persist, it should continue for a long time, then one is going to get not cancer, but a condition that we say is called a pre-cancer. And one get, when one gets the pre-cancer, it takes about 10 to 15 years before it develops into cancer. So unlike breast cancer, cervical cancer has what we call the travel time so long so we have a lot of time to detect this condition early it is a sexually transmitted infection so it is acquired through sexual intercourse in most cases but in some cases through contact it has some risk factors which are associated with and we are looking at the fact that any patient who has sexual intercourse, the first sexual intercourse early, or even has given childbirth at early stages, these patients stand a very high risk of cervical cancer. And if the woman has a partner who also has multiple sexual partners, that woman stands the risk. If the woman has a man who has cancer on the penis, that woman stands the risk. And also, if the woman has an immunodeficiency syndrome, like an HIV, the chances of getting the cancer or persistence of the infection is six times higher than in the general uh, population. So we have the HPV, the human papilloma virus, and there are several of them. We have 16, 18, 31, 35. There are several, but we know that 16, 18, and some few, you can find this in about 80% of women. If we take 10 women, 8 out of them will have the HPV 16, 18, and other ones that we say these are high-risk uh, human papilloma virus. One acquires the infection, 
and then it takes some time before he gets the precancer. So we are looking at these three stages when it comes to cervical cancer. And that is where if you want to prevent the disease, you are looking at the primary prevention, secondary, and then the tertiary. <clears throat> We have screening methods, like for all the cancers. The screening methods for cervical cancer, I'm sure you are most of aware of the pap smear. In fact, it's the one that had been in the system for long. But now we have what we call using the visual inspection with acetic acid. Vinegar, the common vinegar that we use in the kitchen can be used to detect when there is what we call the pre cancer and we use this vinegar apply it on the surface and wait for about a minute and then we see areas that will turn white when we see this we know that areas that have turned white um, are areas that we should target to treat at that point it is not cancer but it is a, cancer, a pre cancer stage, and sometimes it can take about 10 years before that pre cancer stage will move on to cancer. So, if you want to um, um, look at the prevention, then the screening is the second. That is, if we don't vaccinate uh, girls before they even get the infection. So, this is showing how the pap smear is done. It is a painless procedure. This is showing the applying the uh, um, acetic acid or the vinegar. So this service on the right looks beautiful. But as soon as we apply the vinegar and wait for about one minute, this is what we are going to see if the woman has a pre-cancer. So what we are seeing is not cancer, but it's a pre-cancer. And this can be treated before it even moves on to the cancer stage. Next slide, please. Sometimes we even have to use the light with a magnification that can even increase what we are seeing that we call the corposcopy. Next slide, please. Once we see this precancer, we must treat. And the treating, treatment for the precancer stage, two things that we need to do. We can apply heat about 100 degrees to the area that was white, and that is going to cure that precancer condition. Or we even apply some cold that is freezing that point. This is the first treatment, or we can say, let's do operation and cut off the area that is white. And these are the cone biopsies in our terminology. It's just about cutting that area that is showing white. Or sometimes, in some conditions, then we say we are removing the whole womb to treat. But that is reserved uh, for special cases. Next slide, please. Yeah, so if we don't treat, or the woman does not come for treatment when she has the pre-cancer, it develops into cancer. And once it goes into cancer, and for all cancers, we put them in stages, stage one, stage two, three, and four. This tells us the extent to which the cancer has progressed. And we are looking at, is the cancer only on the surface, or it has even moved to the womb, or it has even gone beyond, even to the extent that some patients who come in 
uh, that they cannot even urinate because the cancer has spread even to the tubes that connect uh, for, for the urine to come into the bladder or sometimes even affects uh, the kidney. Yeah, so I mentioned the prevention uh, in passing. So the primary prevention is, uh, as our keynote uh, speaker mentioned, vaccination, because we know the cause. We know that this is caused by a virus, in which case, when we vaccinate the girls and boys before they even start having sexual intercourse, that is the first point in breaking that chain uh, of getting the, acquiring the HPV uh, infection. And then the secondary treat, um, the secondary prevention is to detect early when the women have the pre-cancer stage. And then the third one is if we are not being able to vaccinate them, we have not been able to detect this uh, pre-cancer stage and it has now become cancer, what can we do to improve on their quality of life? Yeah, so I would like to, I think that's about a few slides left. I'd like to conclude by saying that cervical cancer is a highly preventable disease. In fact, if you look at all the female cancers, um, we comparing that to breast, then we should be able to even prevent more for women who have cervical cancer as against for breast. Unfortunately, breast is leading, service is following, and um, we need to detect these conditions very early so that we can offer the treatment um, to improve on the quality of lives of our women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Corney, and thanks for bearing with us. The, your session was interrupted, um, technical challenges and guests as well. We would get right into the next one. We've looked at cancers in females. We would now look at cancers in males. To lead that presentation as the chief executive officer, the CEO of the whole teaching hospital, with a round of applause, let's welcome Dr. John Tampori. Dr. Chair, allow me to stand on the existing protocol. Um, Dr. Corney just started today's year with the men of October. And uh, I should have started with the men of September. Because when you look at the league table that the earlier fellow, the keynote speaker presented, when you look as far as male cancers are concerned, prostate cancer is what is in the league. But the other cancers which, which are in league two and league three. And because September is just one or two months ago, the whole period is going to be used for prostate cancer. So I thought I should come from a different angle where some cancers that we have that affect males are simply not talked about. And so, and another interesting thing I wanted to point out is that when we talk about breast cancer, there is an assumption that men don't have breasts. Yeah, because nobody talks about them. And uh, in October, you see women lined up 
and uh, inspecting breasts and mammograms and so on. No single man is involved. But this process will be more effective when we encourage men to be part of it. Because all men here have either sisters, mothers, or wives. And I just wanted to make something, raise a point here that it might not be very common, but we also have it. And I'm just looking at these statistics. All breast cancers, if you take 100 cases of breast cancer, 99 will be women, but there will be one man. And I think it's significant. We can't forget about that man. And then if you look at all cancer deaths in males, uh, it's not 6.1, it's 0 0.1. I think it's a typographical error. Uh, cases suffering from breast cancer. So we need to talk about it in males. Um, so uh, these are some of the risk factors that affect the development of breast cancer in males. Um, there is a genetic abnormality, and that is 47XSY, what the medical people call the Klinefelter syndrome. And then also, when Dr. Connie was talking, he talked about family history. And in this case, it doesn't matter whether the family member was, fail, uh, was female or male. But third, the first degree family member is a risk factor for de the development of male breast cancer. The factors he has already li listed, they are not different for both male and female. But there is one thing that we take for granted. Because when you look at the age as a factor, the female can breast cancers come a bit earlier. The male breast cancer is about 10 years older because predominantly we get it in the sixth to the eighth decade of life. Another important thing that we need to know about is that Another thing we need to know about is that when he talked about the genetic conditions, BRCA2 and BRCA1, they are very common with the female breast cancer. But in the male, mostly you are not likely to get the BRCA1. It's mainly BRCA2. And uh, one of the commonest risk factors is... Um, testicular trauma or those treating infertility. So what are the similarities? Mainly the treatment is the same. The only difference is that when he presented, he talked about the area where breast milk is made, where it's transported to that is not developed in men. So it's assumed that men don't have that. But the areola region is a very common place. So mainly male cancers are limited to these places. And when you look at the total population, we, we, we say that it's one in a million. What it means is that the real statistics talk, talks about uh, one to 100,000 population of that age brackets. But it's significant and we need to think about it. The treatment is the same as female breast uh, cancer. Whether medical or surgical, it's the same process. Another important cancer that we virtually don't talk about is 
the penal cancer. Uh -huh. I think I've had more than three decades of practice. I have been lucky enough to see three, just three. And one was in the advanced stage that we had to convert into a woman because you needed to remove and then, you know, get a proper place for urination. The other two were in the ages of uh, 60 and 70. They are over 80, they are alive without complication. That means that if it's detected early, you can treat and then get good results. Uh, the survival rate is quite high. I have some statistics I wanted to present on five-year survival so that we see, depending on the grade, which, uh, I mean, how long the patient is likely to survive after management. But we'll leave that because I, I don't have it clearly demonstrated. So what, do we, uh, what are the risk factors? And how, what type of uh, cancers do we get? The three cases I'm talking about were all penile shaft cancers. But most often than not, you get it from the prepuce, the glands, and that is how it starts. In some cases, we have a condition called BSO, balanitis erotica obliterans. There is an infection. That starts from the glands, goes into the tip, the meatus, and spreads further into the urethra. And in some cases, you may have to remove the whole urethra and do a new one and close up. So these cancers are there. They are not very many, but they are very important because for a man, you are a man because you have what men have. When you don't have it, you are no more a man. And uh, we may take it for granted, but I think you need to see the way we relate to these things. Uh, this is one of the statistics I wanted to show, even though I've moved beyond, but I think I need to mention that. This has got to do with the five-year survival rate for the breast cancer. Um, we are looking at the size of the tumor. So when it's less than two centimeters, the survival rate is as high as 85%. But when it's between two and five centimeters, the survival rate in five years is 63%. And when it's bigger than five centimeters, Look at how low the survival rate has gone, 51%. Then we go to the grade. Um, grade one, uh, Dr. Komi talked a bit about these grades without going into the technicality. So in the case of grade one, the five-year survival rate is as good as 76%. That means that if you had 100 people having that condition, at that grade, when you treat 76% are likely to live for more than 10, uh, five years. And when is the grade two, it's only 66 who are likely to live for more than five years. And it's even worse when it's grade three. Just 43 out of, oh, 43 out of 100 will live for more than five years. I will go to another important uh, cancer that again we don't talk about and that is the testicular cancer um, the testes I don't know how to describe it but men know what it is <laughs> well I don't want to use that term because apart from you know that round nature there is also something small that's on top we call it the epididymis so either of them can run into trouble as far as cancer is concerned. And being able to detect it early helps. In the case of the epidemics, most often than not, it's not actually cancerous, it's benign. But 
very low percentage you can have in cancer and you can just use light when it's translucent it's most likely not cancerous but when it's thick or through ultrasound your uh, dark is dangerous you need to look at it take specimen and then you know look at it under the microscope it can also a few cases that look like that, when you look under the microscope, you are likely to get the TB bacilli. And so if you treat for TB, they come out very well and there's no problem. So how can we prevent this? Like we said about uh, breast uh, self-examination, we also have a condition called testicular self-examination. And so, and we recommend it at least once a month. So that if there is any change, you are able to pick it early enough. And then we can come in to help you. And I think the first two speakers all talked about, in fact, they didn't talk, they cried that the patients come too late and there is very little we can do. But I think if we spend much time on you know, awareness creation and prophylaxis, we are likely to achieve a very high level of results, and then we'll be able to cut down on cancer deaths. Um, there were issues about registry and so on and so forth. Obviously, it's the data that will drive you as to the way forward. So this is another aspect that we need to give so much attention to. Get the right data. It will give us the right information, and with that right information, we'll be able to put in the right uh, interventions to be able to reduce these cancers. And um, I think the main one, prostate cancer, the time will be soon. So what I will advise is that anybody here from 1st September onwards, you can listen to the FMs, you can watch television, we'll be there and we'll spend a lot of time explaining it to you. So thank you for listening. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you, sir. We'll move quickly to cancer in children, childhood cancers. Let's have Dr. Lawrence Osaiti, too, specialist pediatrician, general hematology and oncology, head of Department of Pediatrics, the Presbyterian Hospital, as he's here breathing down my neck. Let's give him a round of applause once again because I talk too much. So remember, I've saved time by walking here fast. So two additional minutes for me, right? So that I do some small bashing. So this is very cultural, isn't it? When the father finishes eating, whatever is left, we give it to the children, isn't it? So we have talked about adults. Everywhere, adult cancer, screening, shisha, cigar, dress, whatever, by the way. There's children. Let's bring them to come and speak last. Oh! Timunja Musumawe. You go to church, the adults are in the air conditioning room, the children under the tree for Sunday school. Fix children and everything else will follow. That's why we are suffering. Right? Anyway, by the way, so I've been confirmed, not teaching us, but I know my CEO is somewhere here. But of course, I left my heart in Agogo. So if you introduce me as from Agogo, I also love that. And that is the only place I've chopped big posts before. And maybe that's the only post I'll ever chop. So I, I receive it. So we are here to talk about cancers, but listen to me first before we go to the slides. Let this one stay, don't move. The thing is that we have mentioned alcohol, isn't it? Tobacco, isn't it? Sexually transmitted infection. So I have a child, Nananum, who is one year old and has a cancer. Did he smoke alcohol, a uh, cigar? Did he take alcohol? Did he go to do sexually, whatever? So how then is it possible for a fetus inside the womb of a woman, we do a scan, somebody says, there is a growth which is not supposed to be there on this unborn baby. And it comes out and we check and it is cancer. 
The mother took shisha. <laughs> the father was like Uti, who lost his star. Maybe, maybe not. So that is what I mean by let's fix. If you understand how cancers happen, then it will be clear to you today, I shall propose to you that it is actually a growing child who stands the highest likelihood of getting a cancer because the body is growing. The basic units of the body, which is called the cells, are multiplying and changing. And the basic problem about cancer is not just the fact that there's an abnormality that you see with your naked eye because there is something wrong with the controls. That happens way before our naked eyes can see. Way before tests can confirm. Way before expensive imaging studies can confirm. So by the time you see it, it is way ahead of you. But unfortunately, we are too slow. When I say we, you, 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 me, because it takes the whole community to treat cancer. So, the woman who saw that the child was having fever, what is, how do you say in Hawaii? Hey, sorry. <laughs> Good apologies, apologies. Me, man, now, man, apologies. Then it is not your fault because the commonest thing that causes a door is what malaria. So you think it's malaria, you are right, and you give something. But after one week, still a door, the child can be really in pain. Then you need to think it's probably not malaria again. Let me go and seek help. Then you go to seek help from the professors, right? Wherever the professor may be sitting, whether in the chemical seller shop or hospital or wherever, you still went to seek help. And then the person said, ah, maybe the anti-malaria you took was poor quality. Although the test is negative, we, I have seen that sometimes it's negative, but it's still positive. So let's change anti-malaria another one week. Then you go back and you say, okay, maybe it's typhoid another one week. So you see, the delay was not just here. The delay, actually, the bulk of the delay was with the professors because they should know better. My point is, you need to think about it before you can start understanding cancer. If you, if you don't think about it, if, if somebody is sitting in front of you and you don't figure out that, oh, this could be cancer, you've lost it. So in children, it's even much worse because the cancer presents like anything else, like common cold, like malaria, like I have so many stories of someone just playing football, he was pushed, and then the leg was broken. They took x-ray, it was cancer of the bone. Nothing was happening before then, but for the x-ray. I have a, a nice photo, I just went to Agogo last Tuesday, of course, I want to do some sickle cell small thing, and so, oh, by the way, we have this child, very interesting. The mom and the child were involved in a road traffic injury. So the child had, the head was bashed against somewhere. Now the eyes were swollen and dark. They had, they had nothing, by the way, they are poor, 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 poor. So they, they saw her and then they did CT scan for free for them. And the imaging came back and said, no, we are seeing things that are eating into the bone of this child. And it looks like it could be cancer. No way your eye can tell. So it, it will pass through that stage. Even me, I might miss it. Or of course, I've seen many, so I may think about it. I dream, all I think about is cancer anyway, so I will know, right? But then, that is why you need to move beyond your eyes to test. That's where money, money counts. And money is cancer. Money is time. Time is cancer. If you're able to beat time, and you are finished. And then, for children, the cancers are so aggressive. They move so fast. Although, God bless them, they are so resilient, they are able to stand against every kind of treatment that we give that they survive. So we are the only people in this room who can say, we can cure cancer. Amen. <laughs> and then when we cure the cancer, then you have a bigger problem. As a person like Professor Reina sitting down there for so many years, 
she has been giving poisons to people. Amen. <laughs> the chemotherapy puff is poison. All right. So basically, we are poisoning the cancer cells. And those poisons don't know the difference between a bad cell and a good cell. So they will kill the bad cell and have a strong effect on the good cell. So after, after treating them, you go to bed thinking, oh, in 20 years, what will happen to this one? Professor Kone will treat somebody who is 75 in maybe in the next, I'm not saying I'm God, but in the next maybe six years, that person is God. Why do you understand? But when I treat a two-year-old, I have what? 57 years, 60 years to think. What were the effects of my treatment? Will he, he, and that treatment can even give you cancer later. So for pediatric oncology, it's a different kind of game. And then it comes to how we make sure we make these things work, right? And how we do that is do that together. But there must be a father. Somebody must own the process. That owner is the government who must lead the way and create, I don't want to speak like a politician, but an enabling environment. Thank you. And then everything else will follow. But by, by the way, it has been done elsewhere in the US. That's how they did it. Wherever that they've done successful cancer control. Because no one entity can do it. That is where you come in, market women, your one Ghana CD, doctor, your knowledge and time. How many minutes? I'm done. Um, government, whatever political world that you have, students whatever you can raise and go so that we all have a great fun so that next time when I get a prostate cancer, I will not die from the fact that I know that I don't have treatment, right? So I'll finish my talk. Let's see some photos. So basically, what, why, who, and to whom? That's all the questions women ask me. And that's what, okay, this is important. Uh, oh, picture now more. Oh my God. I had some photos that I wanted to test you and ask you what you think could be cancer. You let's take with C and D. Let's keep it like that. You, you've seen the photos. There was another one. Why is my photos not showing? Oh, Charlie. I spent a lot of time preparing this thing. You know? Okay, next slide. Next slide. Oh, the for two now. Next one. Okay, we know these numbers already, and I've told you that. Um, you'll be late if you are looking for physical signs, all right? Next. All my photos. All my thing is about photos and infographics. And they are not showing. Next, I let me see if you get something. Right? So uh, these are the difference between adult and childhood cancers. The most important thing I want you to understand, there are no screening tests. So you can't take someone and say, screen whether he has a leukemia. Screen the, the Japanese tried it trying to look for neuroblastoma, it was it didn't work, right? So, your only screening test is what thinking about it this could be cancer, and then you look for it. Full stop. That's like, uh, so to see child cancers, I've told you they look or feel normal, they are the same as other things. Uh, I've told you the typical example of the child who was involved in road traffic accidents. There are people who are playing football. They get an injury. There are many, the leukemias come to light too late uh, because they, were, they are all treated for simple common things in our environment. The worst of them all, so in all our data, you see that brain tumors are like, we don't even diagnose brain tumors in Ghana, especially among children. I see we don't have them. It's because it's hidden in the, in the skull. Right? It, is, it doesn't come out the way people see it with the others. And because either our systems are not smart enough to pick them up, or we, you know, by the time we see them, they're too late, they are dead. We don't even know that they had brain tumors. That's one of the big examples. And most of these things, by the way, don't wait for pain. Cancer has very little to do with pain. By the time they feel pain, you are go it's gone. It's gone, 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 gone. And then you can do very little about it. Next slide. So first, thank it. Next slide. This is where I had a photo of the child I saw, but unfortunately, I don't know. Maybe I should have saved it as normal PowerPoint. So when you are seeing things like maybe this one goes to more of the, my friends in the healthcare and the students, reading things are persistent. This is way unusual. It's a new thing that is happening in this child. All of us must be, have a way of following up. And that is how you think that it could be cancer. 
and act on it. Right? And that's like um, certainly there are more. I talk too much. I can't have these few slides. <laughs> so I think I had a slide where there's slide, please. Let me see if it will pull up. So there was another slide where I put where I think the keynote speaker, frankly, I think he has done my job. That's why I decided not to do too much talking, right? In terms of what we can do together. Uh, yeah. And that is it. Okay. You need, seriously, I didn't mean it as quite a joke as it came out, but it is sad for that our country, everything about children, in Kodabi Bia, a afterthought. So we borrow everything from the adult. So in the teaching hospital, it was built for adults. So by the way, if you want scan for the child, come on Fridays. Oh, your hospital there is built for uh, well done, the choir. That's why I come and work there. My CEO is still here, you know. <laughs> so we we really need to change our culture, the way. We think about children. They are not dispensable. You know, it's like they are dispensable. Example like for four. And it's true. I saw a woman crying, 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 and then an old woman came to her and said, Why are you crying too much? Is this the first time you've lost a child? Isn't that deep? So it is normal to lose a child because you will have another one. It's crazy. You can't think like that, right? Okay, so we need to prioritize set in place things to deal with it. And I had photos of some children that I treated in. Agogo, not in city. So we can do it anywhere. So please, those who have the power, especially with training, right? Ghana has different peculiar problems we need to solve. But it's as if we are training them to go and work in the UK. We are not training them to solve our problems. Our problems are not solved by moving the problem to the center you move the solution to the periphery. That is the way we solve Ghana's problems. But the yeah, adopted systems are. So we, why do you think they are going? Because they are better suited to work outside Ghana. We give them that power. Anyway, I did this in the village. Very nice. I hope they are still alive. Oh, this boy had a sad story. We treated the eye and everything. He was from Borga. We kept in Agogo for a long time. Then he went home, got TB. The TB went to the brain and he died. Yeah, yeah, you can treat the cancer, get knocked down by a car and die. It happens everywhere, my brother. In South Africa, we treated AML. The woman was crossing the street, pine, dead. So it's normal. Next slide. Another one. This is one of the common cancers that we treat. You know, now we have very, very good medications to be able to treat with the help of NHIS and Rush. Thank you very much. Now we'll make sure that the kids have to come to the center. One minute, I'm done. The kids come to the center and get the medications, right? I'm just encouraging you that we can do it anyway. Move the mountain to Mohammed, right? That's like, ah, these are some kids. Oh, years, years ago. This, this year, I took these photos. Who are survivors coming to the Confanochi Clinic? So my message to you is simple because it's the general public. Right, one thing, okay? Don't wait, act on it. If something feels funny, go and ask the right people. Right people, when they come to you, think about it. It's better, so people say me, they're my born, I accept it. Oh, they be a cancer, I am a I would rather say it is cancer and I get it wrong than to say it is not. And if you get it wrong, it's horrible, okay? Thank you very much. Wow. Um, can we have one more? One more clap offering. You know, um, when you go to church, the clap is normally like a musical until the pastor says, Beloved, if you clap this year, you have one million dollars in your bedroom. <laughs> clap, five people! And then the the favorite, the favorite, the favorite is that 
my people, it has been revealed to me. That, you see somebody's response, he said, that's right. <laughs> Somebody's also saying, preach. Dr. Cerebro, please, tomorrow I'm resigning. I'm starting a church. If you clap so hard this year, I tell you, in six months' time, maximum the Spirit has revealed to me. Next year, you'll be married. The year after, twins. <laughs> Beloved, clap. <laughs> I can see some market women clapping. If you don't send us invite, and please come and pay the so leave for the pastoral work I have just done. So we think, uh, I believe we've all learned something. But there may be one or two questions lingering on our minds. From the nice talking gentlemanly one to the nice way the pediatricians also presented their case. And we all know when a pregnant woman dies, there's a mortality audit. The district is interested. The MP is interested. It's as if, if you work in the hospital, it's like you are, you are dead. They come in and interrogate. But sadly, you realize when a child dies, but the interesting thing all, all of this is that the marriage which I prophesied, which ends up in the pregnancy, the end product of all of that is the child. But when the mother dies, we are worried. When the father dies, we are worried. But when the child dies, we treat it as a usual mortality and have some small, small. So I think he made a big point that we have to pay more attention to the children, especially because when they have cancers, even if cured, they have a longer span to live and even develop other cancers. So we have to pay more attention to our children. We will start question and answer time, but our mother wants to say one or two things quickly to us, and then we we'll zoom in to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think I have a very big but simple problem with women. We tend to forget that when we are pregnant, we go home. And the same we want to keep secret open to our children. But if it comes to there is a problem difficult to approach doctors and explain to them, oh, maybe this is itching or this they feel very, very reluctant to do that so as i'm here today i think my next move is to educate the men that place is private when there's nothing there but so far as you get the <laughs> don't let don't let it be private straight without knowing what is wrong with you. I had a, a very big problem, a very good market woman that is very close to me. So this time, if I see a market woman with the cloth like this, I will never spy you. I will remove it and see what is there. Not, <laughs> not knowing she was suffering from cancer. She didn't tell us we were moved. Always you see the cloth on the shoulder. When we noticed it was too late and she passed. So please, women, women, cancer is true. Breast down, wherever you see your cancer, make sure you see the doctors. Thank you very much. Thank you, mommy. Thank you, mommy. Um, I think two things are clear. Two things are clear when you are not feeling well or you notice any change there's nothing private about you anymore and what the point she's making is very important because a lot of us wait for so long we doubt it we are feeling shy that we'll go and expose ourselves so please that point is clear the second point is that i saw some people they were like wow you know why sometimes the perception she spoke impeccable english you realize that Nothing wrong. Mommy, 
we salute you. And it's an important point you made. So we'll take, for the sake of time, kindly indicate if you have questions. We would want to take democracy. One question here, one question here, one question here, last question there. Uh, if I have another revelation, we'll add one more question. But for now, I'm not in the spirit. So thank you. We'll start off from this side. So the lady in, uh, or oh, somebody already has the mic. Okay, let, let, let's, let's do from this side. Sorry, it will come to you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So can we have the speakers? I have it with me. So that you can answer the questions, please. Thank you. Mr. MC. Yes, I'm Dr. Emmanuel Harry Tavia Esquire. I'm the national president of the Society of the Private Medical and Dental Practitioners, Ghana. And uh, my question is to Prof. Tego. It's very nice for the very insightful enlightenment of all the journey you went through with us. My question is, one, I read recently in a British Medical Journal, one presentation by a professor oncologist in his research. And his view is that cancer basically is caused by aerobic anaerobic condition. And we are sitting here, since we were born, we've been breathing air, 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 wherever we go, air. We should be grateful to the Almighty anyway. My question is, whether it is true, Prof. Tego, from your research work or from your work you then, whether it is true that at the mitochondrial area, that is the respiratory organ in the cell. It is true that anaerobic is the main cause of cancerous stages. My second one is, from your experience, what are some of the effects, whether positive or negative, of herbal pro products? We know nature has given us something naturally. We know the Bible says we should eat the seed for food, the leaves and the bark and the roots for medicine. To what extent, from your view, have we profited from these areas? Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, please shut straight to the point. And then, so that we can take it. Kindly limit yourself to one uh, question uh, for please, now. Um, please, thank you. I want to ask one question because we know the Ghana family is a struggle to get the cause of the care of the cancer. You know, how Mr. I see Mr. Ram or Maturan say, our innovation is matter. What is matter? Hello. Mike, so that we can hear you. Our innovation is no matter if you can afford. So my question is that you see all you're talking about here, the cancer is true because anybody has it. But I think the, the worst cancer we have in this country and then it is our pocket. If this is a pocket cancer because this pocket cancer is no the the doctor he do doctor he do alone a lot the nurse or the medical staff. And this can the okay, this pocket, this pocket cancer, the only it can take care of this pocket cancer is the government. When I said the government, who is the government? The ministers of health, the health children, okay, and all these things. So no matter what we do, if this pocket cancer, no matter what we do, no matter what we have all right um please okay next person please so uh thank you we note the
the the comment, not the question that uh, there's pocketitis, pocketuma. So thank you for that. Can you? Thank you for this opportunity. Um, please, I would like to ask a simple question. Um, among the youth nowadays, when it comes to sexual life, we know we have this oral sex. I want to know, talking of uh, the cancer with female and male, especially with the genital parts, is it easy for someone to get this cancer through someone who has got this infection, having sex, especially the oral sex? I want to know. Thank you possible. very much. Let's go to the fourth column for their question. Anyone there? All right. We'll take responses from the panel now. Hey, thank you very much. Let me start. Uh, nobody is. Somebody will take one calabash, another person takes one spoon, another takes one glass, irrespective of the size of the glass. And then we have issues because there are active ingredients and then you would also have the side effect. So when we get to the point where we have done enough research and we can standardize these things, I believe we would benefit from the herbal products. I strongly believe they have a role. It's just that we haven't perfected the art yet. Um... The issue of anaerobic conditions giving rise to cancer. Um, I'm not too sure. I'm not an oncologist. Let me issue a disclaimer. But in all my readings, I haven't come across anaerobic conditions being responsible for causing cancers. And if anybody has expertise in that, I'll be glad to have that knowledge as well. So for, from all the readings, I haven't come across anything like that. Um, I think there was a question about um, cancers from the, those that are sexually transmitted. We are getting these cancers because of the presence of these viruses where they find themselves. So if you choose to change the natural order, you know, I was telling some students just a few days ago that God in his wisdom put certain things together. So when you go for weddings, you'll be told what God has put together, let no man put asunder. The reverse is also true. What God has put asunder, let no man put together. The good Lord in his wisdom puts the mouth and the inner mouth, mouth apart. And the mouth and the genitals mouth apart. But if we choose to bring them together through whatever orientation, then we should be ready for the consequences. Thank you very much. So with regards to herbs, so there's one very popular chemotherapy agent that we use, if I'm more than one, Dr. Robinson. There's one called vincristine. It's, it comes from a plant in somewhere in North Africa. So mal your malaria medicine comes from herbs. So when I said we're poisoning the cells, that's what I mean. You extract these things, but there are, you need to use them in a way that is safer for the rest of the body. So it becomes irreversible to the enemy, but you have a way to reverse it, even if it attacks the good people, right? So we are using herbs. Your, everything we are using is herbs. And so we have to invest in our science. If we believe that our herbs are good, we invest in, in purifying them doing research with them, proving that indeed we have these plans that work. And that's what the other people did. And we saw their results and are using. So the same way, why do you want them to come and pick your herbs when you haven't proved to them that it works? So that's what that is. It's, it's as if we, we, we are created separately and specially. So everything we have is sacrosanct. People should accept it. No! 
you work at it. And the same with the pocket. We need to identify that it is beyond one entity. And the same way a family in the United States loses a child and donates millions of dollars into research for the reason why the child died. It is not the government. How many times will it happen in Ghana? But it is the people who do it. So they have their budget $100 million for NIH to do their research, but their chunk. So when I write for a grant, I'm writing for money donated by a family in the US or by taxpayers. If we all do not recognize that, doctor, market woman, student, church, 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 we will not go anywhere, okay? It's no matter where we go. It's expensive over there. They are also looking for money. It is not only in Ghana that we have Poketoma or whatever. In fact, the easiest way to become bankrupt in America, we talk about America as if it's heaven. I hope you are not on the internet or so. It's to fall sick. The moment you get sick, you are gone. It's like their health system that we will, they are dying, also dying from financial toxicity. Not all of them. A few people are able to raise funds to treat themselves. But if you don't have the right health insurance cover, you will die in the US. So we really need to solve our problems locally. Yeah, mine is on the oral sex. Um, one thing we must not forget is the fact that when I was talking about the cervical cancer, and I mentioned the HPV, the human papilloma virus, I mentioned the fact that there are several of such types, and 16, 18, and the rest will be affecting the service. When we do HPV DNA tests, we see the total number of different types of the HPV. And this HPV, the virus, during oral sex, goes through the mouth and through the throat. So we have throat cancers which are HPV dependent. So having oral sex, we must know the consequences, as uh, Prof. Calistego said. This will be the consequences of going through that. These are HPV infection that is causing the throat cancers. More of these are coming up. Thank you. All right, let's, ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for the panel and ask them to resume their, their seats. Please appreciate them as they, they join us. This is still the 23rd annual public lecture of the GMA. It's held under the theme, the epidemic of cancers in Ghana, improving access to prevention, early detection, and treatment. We're getting into our final segment, and, but before we do, I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of our online uh, participants. They've joined us and they've been with us through this period. It's a hybrid lecture, and we're glad that they could be here with us. Let's uh, acknowledge some few people, and then we'll introduce the moderator for the final segment. We have the CEO of Konfuanochi Teaching Hospital, Professor Dr. Dr. Ochiri Adai Mensa. We also have a specialist surgeon, Nyaho Hospital, Dr. Romeo Huse. We also joined by Medical Superintendent Mamobi General, Dr. Lucas Amfo. And Medical Superintendent Dansuman Polyclinic, Dr. Felicia Anderson. So um, we've come to the point where we would have that interactive discussion, uh, where we would have somebody who has been through cancer, those who are into the policy space, financing of cancer, and the, and the, and the likes. And to do that, we need somebody to moderate the discussion and put some of the questions that we have to them. We'll call on Dr. Mary Amwaku Koman, who is a public health physician and works with the Noguchi Memorial Institute of Medical Research. I hope I got it right. 
Thank you very much, Richard and William. Please, let's give them a round of applause. And let's give ourselves a round of applause. It's been a very engaging morning going to the afternoon, and we must congratulate ourselves. This is a very important discussion. We must have it, not just once. We must continue to have it. And it's a privilege that we can do that today. Because of time, we want to do this quickly. But I believe that the people we are putting together to speak to us would help us bring more diversity to what we have been told so far. Our first panelist is Madame Georgina Kuma Jaga. She is a 36-year-old woman now. Back in 2018, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And she has lived through the experience she is going to tell us the details of it. And now she works as the executive secretary of the Breast Society of Ghana. So let's welcome Auntie Gina. Thank you very much for agreeing to share this experience with us. And while she takes her seat, I want to join the, the previous speakers to thank all the survivors who have joined us today. We are very grateful. Our next panelist is Madam Nana Echan Asante. She works with a group that supports cancer survivors. Let, let's welcome her. Our next panelist, I have the pleasure to welcome on stage the Deputy Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Anthony Fusu, who has gladly uh, agreed to join us and bring us a perspective of the service. Dr. Fusu, we are very grateful. Okay. Next, we have a clinical psychologist to join the team to give us a perspective of the, the psychological uh, troubles, problems that cancer survivors go through. And I'm glad to introduce Madame Rita Apia Dankwa, who is a clinical psychologist at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, working with the breast unit. Thank you very much for agreeing to be with us. Last but not the least, is someone that we have seen and heard from today, Dr. Maturain Chuma. Please, thank you very much for for supporting us and for agreeing to, to talk to us. We've had a lot today. I am certain here as somebody who hasn't had cancer before, I'm blessed. But there are people here who have had to go through the experience. I don't know, but what has it been like? What has the journey been like? Tell us about it in, in about five minutes. Try and summarize. Give us an idea of the space so that when we are talking about cleaning, doing things ourselves, taking the initiative, our mother has told us it is no more private. We will understand why we have to take it serious. Georgina, thank you. Okay, so... It's rough. The journey to survival is rough. Um, fat, uh, cancer affects us Our psychologically, emotionally, financially, spiritually. And if you have to go through all this and there is no support, it becomes even more challenging. By support, I mean if there is no financial support, spiritual support, there is no spiritual support. There is no um, support from the healthcare as you would need it. it. It becomes even more challenging. Personally, I was misdiagnosed several times before I was finally diagnosed in 2018. And I realized that I needed to be my own advocate. I needed to read more to understand exactly what was actually happening to me. So I think that kept me pushing for further investigation, even if I go and they tell me they don't see anything. There was um, a point where 
a doctor told me, because I was 30 years and the lamp was painful, um, he was sure it wasn't cancer. I went to him and insisted on a mammogram. But he said, because of my age, I was 30 years then, he was sure it wasn't cancer. At that moment, I realized that, no, I needed to push harder because the pain was persisting. The lump was growing bigger by the day. But anywhere I go, they tell me, no, I'm too young to have cancer. They are, the ultrasound is not picking anything near cancer, so I should just go, go home and continue with antibiotics. I must say that I was traumatized after my first biopsy. It came out benign. But then the doctor insisted that the signs, his, his experience with the symptoms over the years, is telling him that, no, I needed to do further, like a, a second opinion of the biopsy. That was done, and it came out cancer. That was the beginning of my journey. I was confused. So I was like, if I had not pushed, if I had not gone to the push to get to the right doctor at that time, or a doctor that took time to even ask for a second opinion, I'm sure my case would have been different. I got to have my, the lump in the breast room. I had a lumpectomy initially because it was 95% this year. It's an early stage um, kind of cancer. And that gave me hope because I was told that my prognosis were very good. And so all I needed was to get the necessary test that to, the necessary treatment done in time. That, the emphasizing was in time. So I was willing to go through everything that I had to go through. But the time, I was referred to Kolibu after my lumpectomy. And it took three months before I was able to see the oncologist. Between that waiting period, my conserved breast started discharging. The discharge wasn't there initially. And you can imagine how it was like going through, like waiting, that waiting period. It wasn't easy. I was losing weight effortlessly. And when I eventually got to Kolibu, when I eventually got to Kolibu, yeah, they did further investigation and um, I started chemotherapy immediately. It wasn't easy for me because I wasn't really ready for the chemotherapy. Before I came to Kolibu, I was told that because it was early stage cancer, perhaps I would only have to um, take the hormonal therapy because I tested positive to the estrogen uh, receptor. And then I will just have maybe radiation. And because I wasn't really, really counseled on what to expect from the chemotherapy and then how to cope, it became even more challenging for me. I had to be put on other interventions because my neutrophil will always crash to almost zero because I wasn't eating well. I was just broken psychologically, emotionally, all through. Um, it got to a time I was like, no, I need to join a support group because reading online, I realized that if I should get people who have gone through it, because the, I mean, the center was treated, the, the place is very, very busy. And so the doctors can, I mean, the healthcare professionals cannot spend more than a certain amount of time with you because there, there are other, you yourself, you might even feel guilty knowing how long you stayed in there before you were called in. So it's like everybody, you have to go home, you know. So I'm like, if I'm, I should get people who have already gone through, especially um, people around my age, because I was 30, and if I could get somebody that had gone through it and guide me, perhaps it will give me more encouragement to also thrive. But when you get in, everybody is so serious. It's like there is this invisible wall around everybody, like will be a general who nobody really wants to talk, you know, and... I had to break the walls around some people that I realized were around my age. When I realized they were also battling breast cancer, we formed a support group. And unfortunately, we were like six. In 2019, I lost uh, four of those people. Um, it was quite devastating. But then I told myself, moving on, um, I, was, I had to do mastectomy, that is get the, my breast removed, all the breasts removed surgically. Because even after the chemotherapy, the symptoms, the discharge persisted. And so after further investigation, I did a CT and then cytology, it was still evident that there was still cancer in there. So I had to go back to the theater to have the whole breast removed. And that actually challenged me to do a little more or a little better in, um, in, in supporting, um, I mean, those who are already um, helping 
in the fight against the disease. So after my master told me, I told my doctor that I was going to come back, not as a patient, but as a partner. <laughs> So I came back after my um, radiotherapy. I think I was still undergoing radiotherapy then. Mm -hmm. So I would go to the surgical unit on breast clinic day. So I think what I was doing then was patient survivor navigation. So I would, I would encourage those who are newly um, diagnosed and those who are having a hard time accepting um, their treatment plans, especially the chemotherapy and then mastectomy. And I think the Breast Society um, of Ghana identified what I was doing and they um, decided to be giving me transportation so that I would be coming every clinic. clinic day. And so that was what I was doing until recently, um, Embrace Society um, embarked on an initiative um, of getting navigators across the country. Um, so I was um, picked as a survivor. I think the other um, navigators are nurses but I was speak as a survivor. We went for training and that's what I am doing now, a navigator and then a, a counselor. I think the whole journey inspired me. I knew this is what I've been saved to do, to help others. Okay. And so I went back to school to study counseling. So I am back to- Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Georgina. You've, you've shared with us your persistence there seem to be challenges ahead of you, but you pushed through and you have interacted with other cancer survivors or those who may not have survived. How well do you think people are in coping with these challenges and what are they? I also wanted to find out from you, what accounted for that three months wait? Is it because of the appointment schedule yeah. or Oh, okay. The appointment schedule. So appointment it means there schedule. Are in line. Others in line. To We've been told time. this morning how much this is an epidemic. And this is just one place that Georgina was going to. So, yes, you may not have had it. You may not know that it's a real problem that we are dealing with. And just the burden of cases is causing such delays. And we probably can talk about how to deal with that. But, yes, these challenges, how can one persevere through it? as a patient, what is it in you that made you go through that? Because some will stop and go to the church and come back very late. Some would go and sit at home and do all sorts of things and come back when it is very late. What made you push through? Okay, so I think in my, in my case, it was the information I was, I was receiving. I was well informed. Mm -hmm. And so the information empowered me okay. because number one, I knew it was a cancer that could be cured. Great. Given I get the treatment that, you need. that I needed. Okay. And though there were challenges, especially like the financial challenge, my time insurance had not covered um, her septum. It was 9,000, so imagine. Mm -hmm. And then you have to take that 18 times. Doctors, <laughs> even us will suffer, right? So thank you. And I'm going to introduce another panelist very soon, but please go on. Yes, and... The fact that I had also survived other um, life-threatening medical disease in the past, that were emergencies. I've had um, is it broad ligament hematoma after an emergency CS. There were things that I had gone through that could have killed me, okay. but I survived them. So for me, I'm like, this is cancer. The doctors have assured me that they can do something about it. Okay. So all I needed was to get to the right people, do the right thing in time, and I'll be fine. Okay. irrespective of what to come my way. So even though the chemo was like, I remember Dr. Vanderpoel is here when she came here, was like, uh, my, my last review, she was like, this girl has been, uh, is it neutrophilic or something? Like my neutrophil keeps crashing. I, exactly. So it's like, ah, why didn't you change the regimen for her? You know? And I'm like, Ooh. they changed it. Like they reduced the, the, dosage, the dosage then, but still but I knew that I was not helping myself, but I wasn't eating well. Mm -hmm. I would only eat kinky with hot pepper and it ends there. So I knew that it wasn't their fault actually. But then if I had had somebody encourage me like I'm encouraging people now, informing them that no, if you don't eat well, this is where it will end. Mm -hmm. I, would have, I, wouldn't, I would have avoided that part. I wouldn't have gone, to, I wouldn't have gone through that phase of, I mean, going for 
you put in after every cycle. Okay. Thank you, Georgina. So what you're saying underscores the need for us to continue to do the sensitization, creating the awareness. There are students here. There are market women here. The message should not stay here. Let's continue to do it. Every January, October, we do cervical cancer, we do breast. It should not just be those times. Let's just continue the sensitization because when people have the information, they would use it. A lot of the, the bad cases we are seeing with the resultant mortalities are because people just do not know. And sometimes when they, they, they do not know, but the others around them know and they are weak, people can support them to stand. Thank you very much. I want to move to Rita. So this is Georgina. And I would say that she is one in a thousand or a million who can be self-motivated to encourage themselves and move on. There's a lot of psychological trauma that cancer patients are known to go through. At what age do you come in as clinical psychologists to support them? And what sort of support do you give them? And how helpful is it usually in translating to their outcomes? Thank okay, you. so I usually come in at initial diagnosis because usually the news of cancer is devastating. Sometimes people attribute it to a death warrant. And so receiving the news just like that can be overbearing for an individual. So you may meet some patients in the consulting room behaving hysterical or aggressive, they can settle in. And immediately after the diagnosis, they come to my end. And this is where they are encouraged to go through the grieving process to even come to acceptance. Because sometimes if they don't receive this added care, people sit in vehicles and they miss their stops. So they find themselves in other locations. Also the caregivers or significant individuals they may have come with, the blow is to the family as well. And so how the family comes together to move along and even work together becomes imperative or important. So we have to give counseling both to the patients and both to the caregivers as well to help them, support them through it. People equally have challenges actually expressing how they feel. And mostly in the consulting rooms with the oncologist surgeons or other specialists, it's difficult to have the time to express genuinely how you feel about the condition or the disease. Or sometimes you find a doctor saying that they can't go into the social life of the patient. So they need a safer space which can afford them a little bit more time to actually express themselves. Mm -hmm. So mostly in my consulting room, you have lots of tissues there because all the crying and all of those happen over there. Okay. Then you can empower them and equally train them through resilience to be able to embrace the condition and actually make um, decisions about the treatment and the journey they have to carry along. Thank you. A safer space. Very, very important because as far as somebody is concerned, it's, it's something spiritual. As far as somebody is concerned, it's because she has an issue with somebody. This is not normal, you know, and they need to be able to express it to somebody so that we can address their issues from there. You are in Kolebu. I don't think Hollywood is the only place where cancer is diagnosed. How many of your sort are down there at the lower levels to provide the support to at least, if not patients receiving care, those who are diagnosed before their referral, they are, they are referred to higher centers? Well, I think recently the Ghana Psychology Association and the Ghana Psychological Council are doing a good job in educating. So the Ministry of Health and the Ghana Health Services have begun employing and distributing us across the country. Mm -hmm. But then recently with economic crisis, you have financial clearance and the likes mm -hmm. as being challenged. So there are few of us, not many, but I think currently steps are being made to ensure that um, a few facilities have more. So Kolebu, for instance, I think have about 20 psychologists across the hospital. Wow. That is actually not enough because if you have to, some departments don't have psychologists at all. But then others have one psychologist, others have two. So obviously looking at the population, we are being 
overwhelmed or swamped by the number of patients. So I think more needs to be done in terms of employment because I think a lot of people are out there who are not employed and they could be resourceful in the periphery and other centers to help with the okay. journey. Okay, so while we wait for that to happen, do you, for example, have a platform that people could dial in, a short code, something, that even if they can't assess you physically in a facility, they can talk to? Yes. Are so, you thinking about something like that? Yes, so we have something like that. I think that was put up by the Ghana Medical Ghana Mental Health Authority okay. and then the Ghana Psychology Association. So when you go online and look for a smart line to actually contact individuals, you have that. That came up when we had the June dead um, flood that resulted in people um, getting killed, kind of. So we had that smart line, and since then it's been maintained. So you can go online and access a short code, and when you dial in, you get people to, to talk to. But actually more needs to be done in that, in that regard to help everybody know about it and be able to contact for care. But usually I give my patient number to survivors and caregivers where they could reach. So there are instances where you have people calling you You've not attended to them, maybe in Kolibu, for instance. They are calling you from who? They are calling you from their home somewhere in a village trying to access care. So in my own small way, that is what I do to actually reach out to a few more people. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, now we have the extra chair. I'd like to introduce our final panelist, who is a renowned pharmacist. She has a career that spans over two decades in executive management, marketing, procurement, and supply chain systems within the public and private sectors. She is currently the deputy CEO in charge of administration and human resources at the National Health Insurance Authority. Please help me to welcome Dr. Mrs. Ya Pukia Baden. Dr. Baden, please have a seat. Thank you very much, Monsieur, for your generous offer. Okay, so I want to come to Auntie Yechang. I, I hope you're okay if I call you that. Akusia, you are fine. Yes, so we need support for these women from the health facility, from their mm -hmm. homes, but also in Gina's speech, from groups, members, who have similar conditions. And through Embrace, we know that you are doing a lot for these women. Can you tell us briefly how you came about setting up Embrace and then what you do? And let me say that Antia Kosia Chai is also a breast cancer survivor. She's a nurse and she was diagnosed in the US and now she's helping Ghanaian women to go through this experience. So quickly, if you will tell us, thank you. Um, so April, April 1st, 2015. April 1st. Yes. Um, I was, thought it was it a was joke. Real. Yes. Okay. But it was real enough that I also became a statistic. Currently, I think they say one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. But last year, WH um, Cancer Congress, I think that they're starting to see that it might even be lower than that. Um, I always say that I don't wish breast cancer on anyone, but if, they, if somebody must be part of that statistic, they should have what I had. Um, everything that has been said that contributes to success stories, contributes to Gina and so many of the survivors in the audience is exactly what happened to me. Um, awareness led to screening after 40. Um, screening led to a di um, uh, notice that my breasts, my tissues are dense, so I needed to go every six months as opposed to every year to get my mammogram done. That awareness and that encouragement, constant notifications, the six months, come and get your test done is what made the difference for me. Because in June 2014, I did it, mammogram, ultrasound, nothing. December 2014, mammogram, ultrasound, changes have started to occur. 
because I didn't think I would be the statistic, I didn't pay them no mind when they asked me for a follow-up. It took the third notice, which said final, to get me to go. And that's where the advocacy and the persistence and pushing for patients. When I went, I had to get a biopsy. April 1st, a diagnosis of DCIS. Um, for everyone who here is the earliest form of earliest breast form cancer. Of it started, we've noticed the changes, but where it is, is where it is. It hasn't moved past. It hasn't gotten to stage one, stage two. Unfortunately for me, it was a large area from all the testing that they did. So um, my options are you wait and see to see if it becomes invasive. No, I don't know where this thing comes from. Should I wait and see how to make everything expensive financially, emotionally? No. But unfortunately, the area was large enough that a lumpectomy was not an option for me. So once again, I was supported to decide on a mastectomy. But then I said, I don't know where this thing came from. So do a mastectomy and go on tamoxifen with all its side effects for somebody who doesn't even like to take a, a paracetamol. No, I don't want to wake up every day and look in the mirror and wonder, is this the day that it's in the next breast? So what about two? You're gonna, I'm going to go under anyway, so why don't we consider taking off both of my breasts? Somebody may say, oh, it's too early, it's too drastic. Why would you want to do that? But I was supported for my peace of mind with a double mastectomy. I was blessed in that I was in an environment where the planners will go in, will do a sentinel node biopsy. If it hasn't spread, we can reconstruct at the same time. God, who was on my side, they went in mastectomy. It hadn't spread after they took out the first couple of nodes. Um, after an 11 hour surgery, I came out with two breasts. How realistic is that for our women? When I was diagnosed, I didn't have health insurance. At the time, Obamacare had come. Right after diagnosis, I was referred to a patient navigator. She helped me with breast can um, um, insurance, um, directed me to resources. I was getting money for food, $600 a month, for food that I couldn't even eat. Have that? But the, the navigator... If, I hadn't, if it hadn't been for the navigator, I would not even have realized that all these resources were available. And I was a nurse. I was being treated in the hospital that I was diagnosed, but I had no idea. Even for me, it was traumatic, navigating the system. So the essence and the support that the patient navigator gave me and the whole team, I believe, plus support for my family and prayers, Mm -hmm. contributed to where I am today. Okay, so Nanecha, just mm -hmm. because of the sake of time, okay. let's jump to Embrace. Okay. How is this translating to what you do? If you explain the navigator, for the sake of okay. us here and the public listening to us, so that if there is any cancer patient survivor, they can okay. come on board. So yeah, yes. quickly, the day after I was diagnosed, I met my doctor and she embraced me. She hugged me and told me I was gonna be okay. That embrace and that support, I believe, like I said, led to my successful outcome. So after it's all said and done, nothing, no complications, then you start to ask yourself, why did God put this on my table? And that led to me coming to Ghana and understanding what Ghanaian women are facing. They don't have access to, not even, I don't want to say have more than half of what I have. So that's how Embrace started. Um, and then I was very passionate about the support system. So... Like Gina said, I met Gina through Madame Rita um, in Kolebu. I was doing a lot of things informally. I met Rosh and I pitched the idea to the patient navigation. They were already thinking about it. So it wasn't a difficult thing to sell. So they supported Embrace to train um, 13 navigators. Like Gina said, um, she's the only survivor. Um, so we have them all, 10 regions in the country. Okay. So what a navigator does is if you call me, if you call Rita, if you call anyone and you're in Tamale, we can say, listen, go to, if you have, when you go to the hospital, go and see Madame Gifty. And then Gifty pretty much holds your hand and does for you what 
was Others done for me. Done for and you. then along the way, whatever the needs are, be it psychological, be it financial, we're looking to partner with as many people, as many corporations as possible. Because sometimes it's as little as 300 cities that NHI does not pay for diagnostics that can make the difference between life and death. If you, the Herceptin is after diagnosis, but how do you get diagnosed when you don't have 300 Ghana cities? So that's part of what Embrace is doing with our patient navigation is to embrace the women, embrace the healthcare system and whatever needs to be done to ensure a successful outcome. We're there to do that. Thank you. Let's clap for And I'm sure you are doing this very much with the Breast Society of Ghana, which is also supporting. Mm -hmm. So the beautiful thing about the Breast Society of Ghana is a coalition of everyone. Okay. It's not, they're not just, we're in our corner, you stay in your corner, this one exactly. is in our corner. Because we realize that it takes a whole village. Okay. So Breast Society, I'm also a member of Breast Society. Okay. There are other organizations, other professionals, other NGOs, part of it. And the idea is that we come together collectively we have a stronger voice and then we can go to NHIA, we can go to the Ministry of Health, we can help to drive policies that is standardized across the healthcare spectrum so that the woman who's in Tamale has the same access right. as the person who's in Kulubi. Thank you very much. Now I want to move towards the center. Dr. Fosu. Once again, thank you for being here. We are talking about a disease that knows no boundaries. It doesn't know that you are in Accra or you are in Rara. If the tissues go haywire, you're gonna have it. We have a service that is delivered to everybody across the country at different levels. What do we have in place to make sure that the experience of having been diagnosed with cancer is better. Trying to approach a child's experience as much as possible with respect to screening, prevention, uh, management, dealing with the life after. What do we have available so that those listening to us can hear? And if they are having any of the symptoms they've heard about today, they begin to move towards the service. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me on the panel. So basically, our system, and I mean, let me try and explain it, and I'll come to the, I'll talk a little more on the prevention aspect. Our system for a long time has been set up on maternal, child health, communicable disease sort of system. That is how it has been set up over a long period. But then, I mean, we gradually realized that with the transition that we are having with non communicables coming, becoming quite right. significant, then we needed to really look at the way in which we have set up our system. So when you look at the, the current national health policy, it tried to recognize what is happening and try to see how best we can address it. Because, I mean, right from the CHIPS level to the district hospital level, are a legion of preventive cadre of staff who are basically focused on just maternal child health. I mean, and some, I mean, some little aspect. Minor. Minor thing. So how do we leverage on this spread of preventive care of staff to try to bring in the non community and that's what we've started at least that you do the home visits you you have rich i mean the most remote villages they are there so the messaging should not only be the communicable maternal and child health issues but then the non-communicable hypertension diabetes the cancers, cancers. So that you provide the basic knowledge to them. So in fact, that's what we're trying to do that as part of those promotive activities that they do within the communities. This comes up as a feature. And I mean, I mean we've been trying to I mean, celebrate all the cancer days and all that. Mm -hmm. Yes, as much as possible. And then 
when you you take away the preventive aspect and a preventive promotive aspect that we're trying to correct when it comes to the screening aspect the one to when you look at the way the system was structured this sort of screening was only possible i mean at the maybe district hospital level regional level and then the teaching hospitals and it was because of the infrastructure challenge and skills challenge because by and large in this i mean levels you will not have the very skilled staff to some extent so then most of those screening them but then we saw that there were a lot of low tech screening things that can be done at the lower level with some training so for example with the breast cancer because we have the midwives spread out virtually everywhere they can do breast examination easily so why not train them so quite a number of them have been trained now to do breast examination and then the self-examination of course in the prevent they, they teach it also to the women to do their own yes and then the aesthetic acid the via has come in for the cervical cancer so that one to some me because they do the family planning which is very actually everywhere and they have some of the basic thing they have the corpus group that at least they can look at the cervix and all you need is vinegar to put on the cervix and then you can see visually so a lot of the midwives have been trained in that context that they can do and that's one of the approaches in which we, we are trying to do the challenge that we have is linking to care the linking to care because of the way as i said even the care part in is fashion because care is for this is only available at best at the regional hospital teaching hospital at best and it's all because of the issue of the capacity problems and then also i mean the infrastructure issues that we have and that is a challenge for us because basically you have at that level from chips level to the district level virtually about 70 percent of clients that are seen are seen at that level but then the care can only be possible at this higher level and the payment mechanism is also skewed even with the now the current health insurance the payment mechanism is skewed that way that it is that treatment is only paid for from the level of maybe the regional hospital below you cannot you so it means that you need to move so one of the things that is coming out of i mean uh, like within the ghana health of the council is trying to advocate that a lot of these so-called district hospitals that are being put up are quite very modern high-tech hospital we can make some of them secondary facilities that can facilitate access to care and one other thing also is coming up also is the decentralization of the training of the doctors because then most of them they need to come centrally to be trained so then we lose them so why not bring them down to this level have fellows there they may even not be there they come in to see them and then they will be available to offer care at that level so that people don't need to move too much because sometimes the point between diagnosis or or even suspicion, suspicion and final confirmation and care takes forever because sometimes i mean if you've not been down there you don't see how traumatic it is or how i mean it's sort of difficult it's difficult. It is for somebody to tell them that you have been referred to comfort it's like crossing some long ocean yes I mean, some that we take it for granted. I mean, so the person will just delay till it gets out of hand before he goes. So critically, we need to see how we can decentralize. And those are the things that we are looking at. One of the other things also that we've seen that we think we, we think we can leverage on, even to make even the screening, the I mean, and even linkage to care even better. It's what we are calling the network of practice. The network of practice is looking at a health center that we will resource. We're going, we, we're calling the model health center. We'll resource very well, linking them up to the health center is the hub 
linking them up to the spokes, which are the chips, where they do their home visits, etc. And they can refer. So you have a very well resourced health center. There is a midwife there who, let's say, for cervical cancer can do a VIE breast examination, can examine. So then it is linked up to the district hospital. And we're trying to leverage on telemedicine as part of it. So yeah. those are the thing that we think that we need to seriously relook at the current structure of the health system now restructure it to accommodate these non-communicables that are coming up so that we can better address the welfare of the people of the country and i mean provide access to i mean all the type of non-communicable i mean with more emphasis for us the emphasis are being on the diabetes hypertension uh, cervical cancer breast cancer process and unfortunately sometimes we the men get left exactly. out of the Exactly, that's what I was coming yes. to. A lot I mean, of the focus seems to be on the women the because yeah. we, we will make the noise. Yeah. But the men also need to begin. I'm trying to remember World Prostate Cancer Day. The, the men, do you know? September. September. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's, let's put the men, the male cancers too, at the forefront so that it doesn't look like we are just being biased towards the women but yes you've mentioned very and children and children, <laughs> <laughs> and children. ot and children yes go gold yes yes the gold ribbon yes so yes there there are very strategic uh, plans that you have as as a service needs to be very intentional about it. But I think there are some low-hanging fruits. Yeah. For example, we, we're talking about women. And I... Age pregnant, we have over 96% antenatal care attendants will go through the process without a breast examination and a screening you know to be done at least let's ask if she's ever done the screening before and let's tell her about when she can get a screening done for cervical cancer and all that these are missed opportunities that we have in the system you know and we should take advantage of that we've talked about what Kofiefa and the Bator team are doing let's build on that so that we would have the hubs working. A lot of people have been trained. They go back, but they don't have the logistics to work. How can we support them to be able to do this as a service so that we can, we can do these things that are low-hanging once we plan for these things? But yes, these hubs you're talking about would also help. If we move the, the personnel, the workforce, the expertise also down would also help us very, very much. Maybe I should come to... Dr. Chuma at this time. Globally, what do you see is the pattern of uh, engagement and management systems for now in terms of the workflow, the expertise, building the expertise to be able to help with the diagnostics and the management of cancers generally? Well, that's, that's a big question for me. I think uh, <laughs> there are more specialists in this room to talk about it than me. But I, I will share with you what I've heard okay. or what we as Hosh have been Hush supporting Adui. doing. I think uh, one, of the, one of the previous person mentioned it, task shifting. I don't know. I think that came out earlier. How, you know, to, to address... I think the, if you use the other mic... This one? No, this one, the, yeah, perfect. Call that one too, but the focus should be okay, so that our online participants can hear you. Okay, I think uh, I heard the word task shifting earlier. I think how, what are the tasks that can be shift to? For I think it was the case of the midwives, right? Mm -hmm. What are the tasks that can be shift from uh, you know from a clinical oncologist to a midwife yeah. or from a diagnostic, uh, you know. I think for me, that what come in mind. That's something I hear a lot. And that's something I've experienced in India, for example, when I was working in India, I think, uh, because the type of problem we have described in this room is exactly what we see in India and maybe even magnified. 
what Indian health system to your point have done to do to really make sure that uh, you know the system take into account the emerging non uh, non communicable disease, including cancer, was to shift some tasks to uh, general practitioner and to nurses. So that uh, that one thing that uh, I do see. I think the other thing that I do see, and we are very fortunate to be part of the system in Ghana, helping with it, is how can private public partnership help with those low hanging fruits? Right? A good example is we train a lot of nurses, most of them are general nurses. Can private public partnership step in and help train some of those nurses to become uh, oncology nurses, for example? So these are two, two, two elements that we bring up here task shifting and leverage private public partnership. To capture some of low-hanging fruit, and and our our sister from Embrace says it right. I think uh, you know it's really a good example of how private-public partnership can work together to help uh, referral system in the country. So, thank, you. thank you very much, and I I like the points on which. Please let's give a round of applause to to Dr. Chu. I like the point about the uh, private. Uh, public-private partnerships, because we have heard here today, the service alone cannot do it. The government alone cannot do it. So we need as many hand stakeholders involved as much as possible. And that platform for engagement should be provided. And again, maybe this will go to the service and also to the ministry so that we can do this in a very coherent manner. I, I know that in the different months where we do the screenings you know a lot is done how much of the data that we capture for example goes to the center prostate cancer breast cancer cervical cancer the childhood cancers how much of these private engagements are going to the center for us to capture i think we should leverage on these opportunities as much as possible i was saving the best for the last it, as I've said, it doesn't lie with NHI alone, not at all. But we know to this, the extent to which your your engagement, the, the, what you put into the basket, goes to help cancer patients and survivors. You have made us a promise that we should be insured, and you deliver service to us. What are the gaps between the promise that the NHI makes to the Ghanaian public with respect to cancers? The gaps between the promise and the practice. What are the gaps and what are the challenges and how can we deal with them? Thank you very much. Um, I'll say uh, since 2003, the NHIS has made it a point to add cervical cancer and breast cancer to our benefit package. And with interaction um, with stakeholders in the health space, we have been able to add four more cancers into our benefit package. And these are the four childhood cancers. Hitherto, we didn't have it. So between 2003 to 2022, um, we have added Will's tumor. We've added retinoblastoma, what we call as the cancer of the eye. We've added acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And we've also added Beckett's lymphoma. And I think one of the presenters showed the pictures. And in the past, it was a real headache for parents and guardians to seek treatment for children. And Dr. Ose Tutu and Dr. Rena have been very helpful um, in making sure that we include this in our benefit package. But then, you know very well, in any insurance system, you first have to do what we call an actual analysis to find out whether adding onto the benefit package will not cause any problem when it comes to sustainability. What we did is that since 2003, we've had 95% of all disease states on our package. That's road traffic accidents, inpatients, outpatients, um, having surgical operations. I mean, when you have, we have a book we call the membership handbook. When you go to any of our offices, 
we'll be able to know the services that are excluded and the services that we have, the medicines list and what have you. And so with the constant epidemiological data and then some negotiations with uh, partners, uh, again with Roche, we were able to bring on board the novel drug, which we call Herceptin, that's a monoclonal antibody called Transudumab. And I must say that it has helped a lot of patients. Uh, I have a staff who that would, uh, would be paying, as Gina said, um, is a 9,000 per cycle. And when you multiply that by the 18 cycles, it takes you <laughs> way uh, above 100,000. Yeah, even the will suffer. Yes, and <laughs> this is something that NHIS has brought on board because we brought smiles to the people who are now receiving this drug because we have included it in our package. And it was because of the private-public partnership we had with Roche. And so there was this MOU signed between the Ministry of Health and then Roche. And so you would agree with me that our men are crying for prostate uh, mm -hmm. cancer to be included. But the funny thing is that who were those who put the breast cancer and cervical cancer on? It was the men. They were thinking about their mothers and sisters first. And wives. Okay, and wives first. But the good thing is that we've started the costing and analysis so that we can put it on board. But then, as I said, we have to make sure that sustainability is the key word. Um, I heard um, Dr. Carlos Tego talk about uh, funding, funding, funding. Yes, we need funding. But the good thing I would really want to emphasize is that the government under the president of this republic has actually supported us anytime we want to include other um, components into our benefit package apart from the cancers we have added um, uh, family planning we have added um, hydroxyurea and the like so we are amenable to adding onto our package but as i said we have to run actuarial analysis to find out whether it's not going to affect the sustainability of our scheme and so i would say NHIS has done well, and we continue to do well, and we are hoping that we can get that partnership we, we had with Roche, with other pharmaceutical companies, such that we can add on to our benefit package, and so that when you meet us next time, we'll be able to say oh, we've added uh, mm -hmm. mental health onto our package. We've added other cancer, um, um, I'll say cancers onto our, our package, and so that is what we are looking to, uh, to have um as we engage with civil society and then mm -hmm. with health groups as well let's give a round of applause to the nhia <laughs> the nhia is doing a lot but dr baden today here yeah, we've heard about how although this is beautifully written down and to a large extent there's a spirit we're working with on the ground, people have challenges sometimes in accessing the, the medications, the package, the contents of the packages available to them on the health insurance. How are we going to make sure that our provider, our service providers across would be able to understand and join us so that we will be able to really deliver the promise to the people? And then one key thing is screening I mean, diagnosis. Where will I get the money to be diagnosed before I get the benefit package? And for the people who are down there, one of the reasons why they come so late is that. Has that been considered? Is that there? When is it coming? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... <laughs> <laughs> the treatment pathway starts with diagnosis, as you have said. Thank you. And um, we've been enjoined to add it onto our benefit package. And as I said, we've started the costing also on the diagnosis bits, and in no time we would have it as part of our benefit package. And what um, I would also want to talk about is that um, the DG touched on it briefly. <laughs> You are talking about access to medication, access to service. service. Yes, NHIA credentials more than 4,300 facilities. But out of these facilities, there are only seven that 
actually can see to a cancer patient. That is the five teaching hospitals, mm -hmm. and then Accra Ridge Hospital, that's the secondary hospital, and then Holy Family Hospital in Techima. Why? Because you need a multidisciplinary approach team, yeah. and a team. It's not only um, nurses, you need specialized oncologists, hematologists to be part of this team. And so it is not NHIS creating the barrier, but we are being told that we need this number of people in our team to be able to effectively deliver the services we are asking for. Um, just this morning, I was discussing with a friend. I live in Takradi, and some of the breast cancer patients will have to travel all the way yes. from Eziama just to come to Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, mm -hmm. all because if you're in Quanta Regional Hospital, it's not well resourced with the personnel and then with the infrastructure. So we have barriers like awareness that you've talked about, but there's infrastructure um, uh, challenges, geographical challenges. And so the person looks at it as, apart from me having this disease, I need to have transport to travel to Cape Coast and then go and, and, and join a queue. And as Gina was saying, you'll be sitting there and sometimes after three months, you are not called. So it is something that we all have to sit around the round table, make sure we train more human resource who can take care of these disease states. Other than that, we'll talk and talk and talk, and then we still haven't been able to touch the heart of the issue we are discussing. And so we have done a lot in making sure that we bring these drugs to the doorstep of our patients. We have methotrexate, we have Herceptin, as I said, the Vincristin, all of these are covered by the NHI. But you bear with me that we have had issues with people uh, doing co-payments and reports um, that we have received. Uh, we have actually worked on it through our corporate affairs uh, directorate where we get reports from some of these hospitals that they are being asked to pay some amount of money because they are being given these medicines. And so as a nation, we are tackling this and as an authority, we have had a national co-payment committee, uh, which is looking into some of these reports. And we have had some meetings with the DG of um, uh, CHAG and the Ghana Health Service, and then other institutions to make sure that we stem this tide. Because if we want to talk about access, barrier is when somebody takes money from um, a patient whilst he's not supposed to do that. And NHI provides financial risk protection. And so if we are making sure that there are no barriers, we have to also go down to the facilities to make sure that they do not create the barriers for our clients. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There, there, there is light at the end of the tunnel. That, that's what we are hearing. It's, it's a process. Yes. The, the patient cannot wait. Yes. So let's do our best to make it a very smooth, fast process. You know, it may not deliver all today, but once we know that every hour something will be delivered and it will be truly delivered, I think the patient will be satisfied. Before I come to you for your final remarks, we want to give opportunity to the audience to ask two questions to our panelists, two people, specific question to the panelists, brief. Okay, Dr. Charity's hand and then Please, can we get the mic to Dr. Sapo? <laughs> this my senior man will finish me. <laughs> Unfortunately, no under 18s allowed here. <laughs> it's no, it's this one. One man, one woman. That's Dr. Sapo is here. I was doing the two questions then. Ah, uh, okay. Thank All right. You. Yeah, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm grateful to be here this afternoon. Um, my question um, goes to the Deputy Director of Ghana Health Service. I know that with the hepatitis B infection, which can also cause um, uh, liver cancer, I know that so far with the expanded program on immunization, we are doing well on that. But with babies who are exposed at the perinatal uh, stage, um, 
do we have plans in place to make sure that the hepatitis B immunoglobulin are offered to these babies early enough so that we can uh, reduce uh, the burden of liver cancer in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Can we have the second question? Doc has promised me this will be the shortest question in the world. In history, that is very true. <laughs> Good afternoon to all the panelists and everyone. And thank you for a very interesting session. But this is to NHIA. You are doing so much and we appreciate it. But at the end of the day, the tariff is still the same. I think the keynote speaker talked about that. So we begin to realize that we have to make people pay realistic tariffs so that you'll be able to reimburse for the providers also to provide the services, especially when it comes to the medication. Because you keep, I don't mean you, NHI, <laughs> you keep adding on, oh, yes, we are doing this, and very soon it will be part of the package. Oh, very soon, and it's all like, 24 CDs, 75. Are we able to really deliver realistic services and ensure that people get what they need at the right time? Thank you. The right premiums for. I like your summarized question. Maybe we can give Dr. Baden the chance to answer. Then we'll come to Deputy DG. Thank you very much. Um, NHIS is doing a lot. You've said it already. Um, when it comes to tariffs, just um, uh, a few months ago, in March, we actually had a 20% across board for tariffs for services. And then with the medicines, our medicines list saw 40 to 100%, depending on the type of medication. And so um, those in the teaching hospitals, those in uh, the tertiary hospitals who are receiving constant payment on a monthly basis would agree with me that it has actually helped them in their IGF. Because as we speak now, we have paid every facility, be it a tertiary hospital or um, the CHIPS compound, up to January of this year. And we are paying February on Monday. And so we are actually making sure that we don't keep you um, uh, starved when it comes to payment. And a uh, whole teaching hospital. Oh, what's the murmuring for? Please. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Please, let's hear our deputy CEO. Um, hitherto, you know, when we were paying, we were not making a public spectacle of it. So uh, some of these um, administrators will sit somewhere and say, oh, we have not been paid for one year. Now, what we have done is that we have something we call the sunshine policy. It was launched, and then all the various heads of institutions came to NHI. We have made sure that whichever payments we make for whatever month, it is publicized on our website and given to the various facilities and even to the pharmaceutical companies because they come and then they tell you, oh, we've not been paid for one year, which is not the true picture on the ground. And so we are paying as and when we are giving the releases. And as I said, we have paid as of January and we are in July. And by Monday, we are paying February. And I think we have done very well, and you have to clap for us. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please, so, if you are a provider here and you think otherwise, when we close, see, madam. Okay. <laughs> DJ. Yes, with <laughs> regard to the vaccine. For the children exposed that for the antibodies, we don't have plans of doing it. All we are doing is what we've introduced is the at birth. We introduce hepatitis at birth. And then we have plans also to introduce. HPV for 9 to 13 year old girls in school and out of school. We piloted it and it was quite successful. So we made a proposal to Gavi that we want to include it in our vaccine schedule. HPV for girls 9 to 13. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please let's give a round of applause to our panelists again. I think our chair who is our honorable president will give his remarks. So I will not attempt to do a summary, but we are very grateful for the engagement. We have seen that cancer is real. Yeah, here. 
many are amongst us we have seen that the process is the, the journey is not an easy one and support and support is very much needed support at every level including the household level not just the health uh, health sector and also other partners are needed let us work together to make sure that the nhi and any other funding uh, mechanism that we have in place would feel empowered to be able to support the system in a way that will work so that at the end of the day although the journey is painful they will be able to smile and know that the system will work for them thank you very much for your attention please you may take your seat thank you thank you so much let's clap for them as they walk down Wow. So I always hear at conferences or meetings like this, they say at the end of the day, the question is which day? The day never seems to come. So we'll continue working hard to make cancer at least prevent majority of them that we can prevent and make it bearable for those who suffer it. Let's clap for them once again. So at this juncture, we'll call the chairperson for this August occasion, Dr. Frank Shribo, to give his closing remarks. Uh, Mommy has told me she has been sitting for a long, so she needs a few massage. Vice President is looking at her. I believe that means he will deliver the massage. Thank you very much, Richard. And I don't uh, think that I will attempt any summarization here. Mary, I'm not going to summarize. Um, I think a lot has been said today. We've learned so much. And um, I believe that Lauren says to have brought the lights squarely on the children. And I am a child advocate as well. And I believe we should focus also on the children as much as we focus on the adults. The panel discussion, we only saw adults. We didn't see any child. So it's important that uh, we focus on the children. Um, I believe we need to look at this issue of cancer and tackle it head on. Rush has done so much and they continue to do so much. We are very grateful to them. For NHIS, NHI, I, from here I'm going to see Madame because some of my money is in there. I don't understand why I am not up to January. I have to go and see her. But the point is that it is not just about the premium we pay. It's about the insurance levy. It's about the fact that that levy is not fenced. It still goes into the consolidated fund and you heard her as and when we are giving funds. It shouldn't be like that. We should, uh, that is the only way we can de decide the gaps or determine the gaps that exists in the funding. If the money is fenced, and we know that this money, nobody can touch it. And that, this is how much we are making from all the levies we pay regarding NHIL, then we can decide how much we will need to add to be able to take care of ourselves. So from here, let us make it one of the issues that we have to raise and continue to raise. I don't know why. Because once you put the consolidated fund, it's very easy for the politicians to touch it. And they will use it to go and do elections. And so we need to fence that money. And then we determine the gaps and be able to then know where we need to find extra. NHIS should also begin to pay realistic tariffs. It's very important. I have a story of my own niece who went to a hospital for only 24 hours when she came back her bill was ten thousand us dollars it was for a cold ten thousand us dollars for cold and her insurance company is responsible for paying that you see a patient you struggle all the way through and then you are paid 18 cities 50 pesos for as a tariff so we need to look at it and i think that it's important that if you are talking of cancers, we have to look through all the spectrum and ensure all of it 
is fully covered and taken care of. And beyond cancers, I think there are other important issues we would also have to look at. As Ghana Medical Association, we would be putting together a position paper, which we usually do, and most of the time when we submit it, it doesn't go anywhere, but we'll continue to submit it. And we'll continue to talk about it. Thank you very much for coming. I'm sure somebody may be here to give us a vote of thanks, so I wouldn't bore you, but I believe that we've learned so much. And we are so much happy to have all of you being here with us throughout, and I could see that uh, none of you were bored in these discussions. And, it took, and thanks to the uh, women who came from the market, uh, look, me, look at me carefully. When I come, please. So you reduce some for me. And thanks to our nurses and our medical students yes, for, for coming. We, it's been fantastic. And I have enjoyed it so much. So Richard, I'll leave there. Thank you. Thank you to you. And then you can continue from there. Thank you very much for enjoying this. So it's said that there's no duty that is more agent than that of giving thanks. So we swiftly say thank you to um, GMA first as a body and also to the Greater Accra Division for ably handling this public lecture. Let's appreciate GMA for delivering this. And also to all of you key stakeholders who turned up Time will fail us if we attempt to mention names all over again. But we do appreciate every single key individual that has been here, from the market leaders to the clinical leaders to the pharmaceutical leaders to the uh, financing uh, leaders who our, chair, our president is going to investigate for January reasons. <laughs> But we are grateful and we thank NHI for showing up. We do not intend that we set this up as a NHI bashing session. Uh, they're doing well relatively with timeliness of reinvestment, but I think generally the complaint is about the quantum and against the re reality of what happens on the market. So 25% increase. 40 to 60 for drugs, et cetera. But how much is this changing on the market when we go to buy to stock for the facilities? That is probably increasing more than that percentage. And so that's the crux of the matter. But we appreciate the timeliness now in monthly uh, br bringing in financing to help run facilities. We would thank our media partners Multimedia, Joy FM, Adum FM for their partnership through the publicity and the coverage they have given us. And also, we can't leave out our sponsor, major sponsor. We know them. They are called what? Rush. And it is spelled what? And remember, remember the phonetics. A is not for what? <laughs> All right. It's, it's all right, so thank you all once again for being here. Uh, it's been our pleasure to do this together. My name is Dr. William Oche Frimpong, and um, my name is, I am not Richard Sullivan. <laughs> Coming out soon to a book joint near you. <laughs> all right, uh, thank you. Uh, quickly, members should just take note that the association, in partnership with MTN, is starting what you call some association bundles for doctors. That makes it easier for us to talk to each other and discuss cases, whether it's cancer or others. Uh, members in good standing will just pay a token, the least being about just with 10 Ghana cities, you can call any doctor for free for as long as you want. And oh yes, once you sign up ten, with 10 cities to the bundle, automatically you'll be rolled on. The only catch is you must be in good standing. So make sure you are paying your dues on time and you'll be put on. Thank you very much. Um, please, we are going to close by just a few housekeeping uh, things. The, our mothers have to get back to the market. So our, ma our mothers and everybody else will wait, but our mothers will be served first. Lunch will be given to you so that you can move back home quickly. 
so that we don't queue any, anything. So it will be in packs for us. Please just have your seats. We have a lot of ushers to go around and make sure they serve you in time. Council members, uh, kindly hold your fire. You will not be served uh, until everybody gets served, you will fast. And then the committee members as well. So we'll call Dr. Papa Pumpulampu. Dr. Papa, hey, sorry. Re Reverend I, I, Dr. Papa Please, Pupulampu. forgive me. Let's forgive receive him me. to Reverend give us the Dr. closing Papa prayer. Pupulampu. Shall we rise for the closing prayer? Beloved, respectfully, shall we all be upstanding while we pray? Great things you have done. Great things you will do. Unto you, God, we give the glory. Many work out, Joe, you put a yahoo wale. Ah, oh, Momono, how work a young way. A jacker, one young, he was shed. Bonisa, oh, yam, so mole. Toy, a pay, a pay, a bow. One cashida, how. Into ye, you were ye, ye, that was say. Ye shall win, you monya mara. Young a jar on the yard, done ya done name. so do do. Now, pe, be yampa. Mo, mo, e japa, se uye sabra. Wama ye hu kwain. Ye ni wabe pensen pensen mo se ni me yine fa kukrum ya re yon. E japa. Ya esre ane se bie ya june mo na ye nyanem dia ye de beswa no. Ma ye ye hon hom na kenya ye. Na bibia ye ye bia no. Ma ye nkotna be bi be bia radana ka se obi na ye ye. My name, dear. Now, say, see ye yen and see ye cray yea. Ye dear ye yea and ink a bene dear mouth. My yen swano. Nay, yen yaw was a mensura. Nay, yen yaw far hunting. Yen him so do ye and bedrus our quam on a white jar ye. Now, say ye ting. Nay, a fat our freno. Yen a jar on de ubi biara and ye will dear. My own yen sin and ye see ye. Now, say ye coof ye. Na ye she ye nu ano mo crying. Na mo hu wa ma po mo dinne si ye a. Ye ni se wo erade en awa ye. Now my Christian friends, shall we go home with the blessings of God? May the God bless you and keep you. May Yahweh lift His face upon you and be gracious unto you. May the God of grace lift His light of countenance upon you and give you eternal peace. You that have been blessed, go. And be a blessing unto others in the name of God alone, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This academic prayer, please. Let's sit down. Let's sit down. Let's be in our places.